Chair Bridgman, you're now live on YouTube. Okay, thanks very much, Lauren. All right. Well, welcome everybody to our uh, resumption of our planning committee and our uh, official plan review working committee meeting. This is our third meeting uh, that is rolling along here. So I welcome everybody and I'm going to call it to order at uh, 102. So um, again, I'm I've got a number of procedural things I need to go through here. Uh, this is an electronic meeting. It's being held in accordance with section 238 of the Municipal Act. 2001 due to COVID-19 pandemic. I am confirming that we have eight of our 10 planning committee members here. Uh, we are missing Councillor Jaglowitz, who I believe is going to join us a little bit later, and Councillor Nishikawa, who often joins us just a little bit later. And Excuse me, Chair. Councillor yes. Jaglowitz has joined the meeting now. Oh, he has. Great. Welcome, Frank. All right. So just uh, <laughs> just uh, Councillor uh, Nishikawa, and I see that we have all of our um, all of our uh, working committee here. As I see, Lori's just popped on, so that's great. So we're all set to go. We have quorum, and uh, the CAO is here. Our clerk is here. Our uh, director Pink is here, and other members of our staff. So we did take input in planning at MuskokaLakes.ca. Um, and I also want to just remind everybody that this is a public meeting, it is streaming and it is recording. And uh, by being part of this, you are agreeing to your image, voice and comments being recorded and posted online. All motions are, are um, pre-populated randomly so that we can keep the process going. Ex ex I, I, I expedite. Expedite, I'm having trouble with that word, expedite the process. Voting will be done by raising your hand. If we can't do that, we'll call everybody's name, but that won't be considered a recorded vote. So there is a supplementary agenda today. Um, Ms. Walton will be here in just a few minutes to, um, to um, do her presentation. And um, any disclosures of pecuniary interest from anybody. Seeing none, I'm just going to read a motion to relax our rules a little bit here uh, today. So move my member Jaglowitz, seconded by member Mazan. Be it resolved that pursuant to section 2.3.2 of the Township's Procedural Bylaw 2019-079, the rules of procedure are hereby suspended for the duration of the official plan review of the first draft and that they be reinstated at the conclusion of the review. Any comments? All in favor? Okay, great. So I believe we can, um, Mr. Pink, do you want to say any introductory remarks? I think we're stage three of here, here. so um, I think we're good. We're just going to jump into this um, then immediately. And so Lauren, if you could bring Ms. Walton in, that would be great. Uh, we don't have her in the waiting room yet. Oh, okay. So I guess what we're going to do then is if it's all right with you and um, welcome Councillor Nishikawa, if it's all right with you, um, Mr. McDonald, maybe we can, do we, do you have a few remarks at the beginning here and we can see when Ms. Walton comes in? Uh, certainly, uh, Chair Bridgman, I always have a few remarks <laughs> at the beginning to <laughs> share with you and perhaps I uh, can talk a little bit about the, the roadmap as, uh, as we see it going forward. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and hope everyone had a great long weekend and a, and a, and a great Easter. Uh, so this is, a, I guess, our session three. It's planned uh, to start at one, which we did, and end at four. I might have suggested uh, last week that perhaps we can go beyond four, but I've thought about that. I think three hours is long enough, so let's plan to to stop at four. Uh, we did already agree on a fourth meeting, and that is the morning of the 16th, if I recall. So we do have that uh, date as well reserved uh, for uh, further discussions on this very important topic. So. The plan for today, as I see it, is to continue going through uh, the policy directions um, and basically start off where uh, where we left off, and that was with policy direction number three, dealing with flooding. Um, so uh, certainly I'll go through that. And again, as it was in the last session, 
um, I'll go through the policy direction, uh, or Jim may go through a couple of them as well and direct uh, you to exactly where in the official plan we've accommodated uh, that particular policy direction, and then we'll have a discussion. So we'll do exactly the same thing. I'm thinking that, um, and again, I'll be an optimist. I was an optimist last week as well. Might as well be an optimist this week too, uh, that we could get through all of the policy directions today, except for one, uh, with the last one being the one dealing with uh, resort commercial and resort policies. I do anticipate there'll be considerable discussion on that point. Uh, so I'm thinking that if all possible, if we can get through all of them except that one, and then we can reserve uh, the morning of the 16th for a discussion on those policies and anything else, I think that would be a great plan. So I prefer not to get into resorts today, I guess is the message because we know and we all know it's a it's a there's a lot to talk about there um, i also wanted to um indicate uh, and this was uh, suggested a couple of times by a few few members of a planning committee that sometimes it, it it might be a good idea to leave a policy as is just to see what the public says um, and that was uh, suggested a couple of times. I think that's a good one, unless there's something we've done uh, very wrong or have gone completely in a different direction than perhaps you anticipated. Uh, but sometimes uh, getting that public input also assists with the making of decisions on policies later. And I know there were a few examples of that, for example, grandfathering that we talked about last week uh, that may benefit from that. So just keep that in mind. Obviously, we're here uh, to to respond and and uh, and talk to you about anything uh, that is raised. And my last uh, preliminary comment is uh, to reiterate that this was a first draft. It isn't perfect. Uh, we do see places where it does uh, need some work, but that's what first drafts are all about. Um, and as I indicated last week as well, it's not too often that a first draft is uh, hung out on the on the clothesline, so to speak, as this one is for everyone to see, every comment's being recorded. Kind of interesting and new for me, uh, certainly, but I'm, I'm all obviously uh, happy to go through whatever process uh, planning committee and council wishes us to go through. So with that being said, those are my initial comments uh, subject to anything that Mr. Pink wants to add. Um, and I understand uh, we do have a deputation and perhaps after the deputation, uh, I will get right into it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. And yes, it is unusual, but I wasn't gonna go through all of that myself again today, <laughs> done that two days. Um, so Lauren, is Ms. Walton here yet? No, she isn't. Have we heard from her? Oh, she, so she's, she's hovering, trying to get in, I think. So would it be very disruptive, Mr. McDonald, if we started and then when we have a sort of a natural break, we could have Ms. Walton come in? That that's, that, that's perfectly fine. So we're going to start with uh, policy direction uh, number three, uh, dealing with uh, flooding hazards on lakes. We almost got there last uh, last time, but we we uh, didn't get there. Um, I think both Jim and I will provide uh, our thoughts on this one. Um, and very quickly, uh, the policy direction uh, did include uh, uh, basically directed that the official plan include policies that uh, direct the updated zoning bylaw to include provisions that require updated provisions on minimum elevation of certain openings, second story, and so on. Include enhanced policies that require best management practices for stormwater. Include policies that direct the updated zoning bylaw to prohibit uses beyond the storage of boats. Include policies that direct the updated bylaw to prohibit storage of any kind of hazardous materials within an appropriate elevation require site plan approval for every new or expanded boathouse. That's certainly a new thing in the Township of Muskoka Lakes. And then lastly, include policies that direct the Township to prepare guidance material on how to build and alter boathouses in a manner that is supportive of lake system health. Um, I'm wondering if Mr. Diamond can also comment on the philosophy that we adopted in updating uh, the policies on flooding in the official plan for a moment before we jump into exactly where in the policies we've accommodated uh, that policy direction. Mr. Diamond? Sure, thank you and uh, good afternoon all. Um, I think at a very basic policy level, we need to appreciate the fact that um, the, the provincial policy statement says that um, we shouldn't be putting 
uh, people and valuable things in the floodplain. And it's a rare uh, opportunity in Muskoka to build a boathouse. Um, and that opportunity needs to come with some consideration of what the potential of that boathouse is on other people and the environment. And uh, I think we discussed this in a great deal uh, or for quite a long time during our, our committee meetings. And uh, I think the policies that we've drafted reflect that. As uh, Mr. McDonald said, uh, new boathouses would be subject to site plan control. And it's only through the site plan control process that we can regulate the things like the storage of solvents during the flooding season um, and uh, the, uh, the uses of the building as primarily for st storing boats and recreational equipment, not for human habitation. Um, I've heard a number of comments from people in these sessions over the last two sessions and in other places about the uh, new idea of having large screen TVs in your boathouse uh, and that uh, you, other people can see it from their property. And certainly that isn't in my mind in keeping with maintaining the character of Muskoka. So the policies are established to do all of those things. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Diamond. And in particular, you'll see in the right-hand column in the policy direction companion document that we did include a section uh, in the official plan section E11 that deal specifically with uh, uh, flood hazards. And there is a number of sections in there. Uh, we did include, um, in, uh, I guess, an enhanced section on site plan control in section E49. And there is a new section on stormwater management in section D2.4 as well. Uh, and within section E11, uh, C, D, uh, and F, I'm just looking at my list, we do include the uh, individual policy directions uh, that I just went through. And then lastly, in another section of the official plan M4, it requires site plan approval for new and expanding boathouses. Are there any questions on how we've uh, uh, incorporated the, the policy direction in the first draft? Okay, any questions or comments? Ms. Lundell. You're on mute. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I was wondering where the definition of habitable will be defined. Will that be in the zoning bylaw or will that be as one of the appendices to this plan? Well, that's a great question. I do know the zoning bylaw does get at that particular issue. Um, Mr. Diamond, you, if you have a thought on that, uh, perhaps you can weigh in or Mr. Pink. Yeah, I would. It's a zoning bylaw definition. Um, although I'm old school from when we didn't have definitions in official plans, um, where official plans are to be policy. And my good old friend, Rusty Russell, used to say to define is to confine. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's a zoning bylaw matter. Uh, so Mr. Clark. A uh, big surprise. I won't be in agreement with this one either. Um, uh, I'm, I just, again, get very confused about people trying to tell um, property owners what they can do within their buildings. Uh, there's plenty of people that want lower level lounges now um, to get out of the sun. Um, I, I understand that, you know, I guess the uh, um, what we're all talking about is, again, don't watch a TV in your boathouse, don't sit in your boathouse. Um, I, I agree with you that, you know, solvents, chemicals, et cetera, need to be stored correctly. We have to worry about flooding issues. Um, would love the township, the province, et cetera, to actually deal with flooding issues. So when you're collecting rent and leasing, uh, uh, values from us that uh, the properties we put down there will actually be safe. Um, maybe we should focus our efforts there. Um, we already are under site plan to put a three story or a two story boathouse. Um, there are no living accommodations. Living accommodations, I believe, are currently defined as um, bedrooms, et cetera, and they shouldn't be allowed in lower areas. They should be allowed to have sitting areas. And just to remind everybody, I look at lots of old properties on the lakes. Uh, we sell lots of old properties on the lakes. 
Guess what was in the lower boathouses? Pool tables, ping pong tables, bars, no bathrooms. I wonder where they were going to the bathroom. Um, so, you know, I think we've come a long way with how we build these. Uh, the materials we use are environmentally friendly. Um, I can assure you when people are putting all of these expensive things in their lower boathouses, um, they're not watching, them. they have property managers, they're not watching them float down the river uh, when things get flooded. Um, so that is uh, dealt with. I think our bigger problem is the people that are the old cottagers that have their gas down there and have, you know, cans of oil and things like that that are sitting on the deck. So yeah, Muskoka is changing and almost every two-story boathouse that we're requested to build is permitted with a fish cleaning station. So let's think about that. Um, that's being allowed. Um, and we have lots of people that have uh, health conditions, et cetera, that don't want to sit out in the sun for 12 hours a day. Um, my final comment on that is, you know, uh, if we're worried about noise bylaws and things like that, um, when they have a lower level, they're actually sitting inside. Um, if they don't, they're on top of their boathouse or they're out on the dock making noise. So um, I, I just don't understand what the impetus for this uh, for this is, and I think you know environmental protection again is just being um, almost abused in this case. So um, thank you, Mr. Scalati. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I recognize that we now have uh, pretty good uh, flood mapping capabilities, but I'm just concerned, ignoring the boathouse issue for a moment, about informing or making sure that property owners are aware if and when they're planning to build in a flood plain. And I'm not just thinking about uh, over the top of the land water. I'm also, as I mentioned previously, concerned about the water table rising up into basements. And I, I think the township could uh, play a role here in making sure that whenever a permit comes in, that one of the things that uh, is checked is whether or not that property is in a flood plain and at least uh, stamping the plans with something like warning this building is being done in a flood plain area. Thank you. That, that's a great question. I'll take a stab at uh, providing a, a quick answer. Uh, we're certainly aware of the updated floodplain mapping. We've seen it. Uh, there are a couple of schedules that show uh, where the floodplain mapping exists uh, in your urban centers. And we did uh, talk about as a team how we should deal with this issue going forward. And there will be and there are policies in the draft plan that will prohibit development within floodplains. That's clear, that comes directly from the provincial policy statement. But our collective thinking is that the floodplain mapping would make its way into the implementing zoning bylaw uh, so that folks would be able to see when they're looking at a map where the floodplain is. Uh, the permitting department obviously would be aware of it. Um, and in cases where there's a dispute or some doubt, a surveyor has to be called in uh, to look at exactly where that line is. So that is the approach we're proposing uh, to take uh, going forward with respect to the mapping. The mapping is available now. I'm not sure how available it is, but it is completed. Um, and I'm not sure how it is to be made available in the future for, for all folks to take a look at. I don't know, Mr. Pink, did you have anything else to add to that uh, point? Mr. Pink. Uh, hello, committee. Uh, thank you. I would just confirm that the uh, flood mapping is available on the District of Muskoka website, uh, and I believe uh, soon to be, if not already, on our uh, web map as well. Thank you. I okay. thought that was the case. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I. Uh, I couldn't resist the opportunity to uh, make a comment on some of Mr. Clark's comments. Um, uh, on properties, there are plenty of places to sit, sit, sorry, sit in the shade on the land. I mean, fish can be cleaned on the land. Um, I, I have a bit of an Australian background in that my daughter lives there. I know some Australians. And their uh, boathouses are called boat sheds. And so maybe it's more appropriate that we re rename them boat sheds. And if there's a desire to have uh, some form of habitation on the water, that it be given a, a, a different uh, classification. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. 
So thank you, Councillor Jaglowitz. I'm I'm going to suggest that a, a debate on this more or less might be more appropriate when we come back with our next draft after we've had the public input. That's my only comment on that. Um, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Bridgman. Um, I, I want to sort of put a comment on the table. Um, you know, we may affect some changes before that goes out to the public. Uh, because when it does, I'm not sure whether your phones or emails have been ringing, but there's been lots of questions and concerns over suggested policies. <coughs> Excuse me. And I do realize also that, uh, you know, our council is very good about uh, wanting council to have a general blessing on something before it just goes out to the public, as we've done a number of uh, condo agreements, if you will, that we wanted to make sure we were comfortable with them before the public theoretically saw them. So, I'll circle back on floodplain mapping. And there are certainly areas within Muskoka, Muskoka Lakes in particular, that are floodplains. I'll take Port Carling Harris Street, for example, that when we had the flood of 2019, many of those cottages, you could swim around the cottages and homes, and they would certainly, there was no high dry part of their properties, and those should be considered concerned properties. We talked last week a lot about steep slopes and properties. When where people are building 100 feet of elevation or 200 feet of elevation above the water, some form of living activities down on the water or recreation, people don't buy waterfront cottages or have waterfront homes to be 200 feet back in the woods. I'd buy a house in Bracebridge if I wanted that. They buy on our lakes for a waterfront experience. So boat sheds on shore, though they were easy to build many, many years ago, there was one around the corner from me that's long since gone. And uh, boat houses have been replaced. I will say I am not in favor, as we have seen some people push the waterfront living in a boathouse, where there's a single slip boathouse that has been built for the sole and express purpose of having more living room down on the waterfront. That's not the idea and intent behind it. But I have a number of people who are 150, 200 feet, 300 feet straight down, 200 stairs down to the waterfront. Grandma and grandpa have a heart attack when they need to go upstairs to go and use the facilities. So facilities in some form of uh, out of shade activities within the boathouse, I think, and especially on the size of the property, fully is appropriate. I think we need to look at implementation in our zoning bylaw, a greater control. And that would be, and I, I pick a number that no more than 33% of your boathouse can be used for a couch or out of shade. It's predominantly supposed to be used as a boathouse, but there would be allowed for some area to get out of the shade. And uh, as uh, Bob Clark has said, you don't have to drive very far around the lakes. And I don't know of a new boathouse that hasn't contemplated some type of indoor couch sitting bar area on the water uh, of new boathouse builds. So people want to be on the water. They want to stay on the water throughout the day, but they also don't want to be exposed to the sun. Um, we can change that. Absolutely. We, we can push people back. We can eliminate boathouses. We can get rid of all that. But at the end of the day, that will drastically change the character of Muskoka and character of Muskoka Lakes. Um, so I, I'm in favor of a limited amount. Again, if I'm building on the water, I realize it's a floodplain and I can build a higher level of elevation. Uh, I think as Bob has said, truly the problem is gas tanks and people with old boathouses that just store fuel and uh, oils down on the docks and don't put things away during the off season. Because last time I've looked, we didn't really have much of a flooding problem in July and August and September. So I'll leave my comments on that just for the record as we potentially put something out to the public in the next uh, month or two. Okay, thank you. Um, Patricia. Thank you, Chair Virgin. I, um... It's a complex issue, there is no doubt, and the desire is there. I believe 
that uh, Mayor Harding has just mentioned, that there's probably room for compromise in terms of guiding the building of two-story boathouses and what can be done on the main floor. And I tend to agree. Um, if there are no facilities there, and it's 250 feet up a cliff to go to uh, use the facilities, then I think we've got an environmental issue. I'll hold it there. I believe we're going to probably send this out as is to public comment. Um, and I, I know already a lot of the comments. My concern, and I believe probably Chair Bridgman, you will ask me to park this, but my concern is that in flooding hazards, and even in Mayor Harding's comment about Harris Street, there is no guideline as to what we do about all of those properties that are built in the floodplain. On my bay, I know of three. One was built within the last 10 years, 66 feet back from the high water mark, and is now, both buildings are totally in the floodplain. Now, they're relatively new, but what are, what are we going to do with them when they ask to rebuild? Are there going to be guidelines for how, or are we going to refuse them? Are we going to let them fall apart? Those are the concerns that I wanted to see addressed in the OP flooding section. And I think we've got to come to terms with it because it's out there. And yes, that floodplain mapping, you can get it in an instant from the district website. So I ask uh, Chair Bridgman, uh, Director uh, Pink, uh, how, how do we address that now at this stage? Thank you. Uh, good, good, very good comment. And I have uh, Director Pink first and then Mr. McDonald, I'll go to you. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to comment on the last uh, two or three comments. In regard to member Arnie's comments, I have already spoken to Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond about uh, lack of policy or guidance with respect to existing structures in the floodplain. And I believe uh, we will work on draft two to provide some language as to what to do with uh, during reconstruction, modest additions, et cetera, of existing buildings within the floodplain. Uh, with respect to the earlier comments on a compromise or allowing uh, a portion of an area to potentially be used uh, as a sitting area. Uh, you may recall when we updated the zoning bylaw 2014-14, uh, we did actually come up with that alternative. Uh, we called it a sun shelter. It was a rather unique uh, or new initiative on our part. Um, we put uh, pretty good controls around it that it must be tucked in closer to shore. We limited its size. We required it to be opened uh, on all sides or I believe at least three sides. And uh, we did permit those now for about six years in the zoning bylaw, uh, which would allow people to uh, get out of the sun, to have a sitting area, uh, but to be essentially a boat port. Uh, the, uh, the restrictions we put around it essentially are that it will contribute towards your boathouse size. So when we changed the zoning bylaw in 2015, we didn't say you could have sun shelters in addition to the 75 feet and all your other permissions. Uh, what we have seen, uh, just anecdotally, uh, is an extremely low uptake. I think essentially what we're seeing is everyone wants their cake and eat it too. They want uh, their boathouse to the full size that they possibly can, and therefore it leaves them no room to then build the sun shelter, which we've allowed. Um, perhaps that's a broader discussion at a zoning bylaw stage if, if future councils are uh, you know, uh, amenable to allowing a bit of a greater density along our shorelines. We could consider sun shelters in addition to boathouses. Um, but I think again, uh, it was fairly unanimous at uh, the policy direction stage to prohibit habitable uses in, in boathouses. Uh, I think we've heard uh, to hear from the public and then we can uh, uh, proceed from there. But I thought that bit of background might be helpful that we do allow sun shelters, uh, but again, very little uh, uptake in the community that I've seen. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Mr. McDonald, you'd like to comment? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, thank you, Chair Bridgman. In implementing the, I guess, policy direction C that it basically said prohibit anything beyond storage of uh, boats and non-hazardous, when we actually implemented that in section E11, we added the word primarily in front of that. 
uh, because we anticipated that there would be a discussion on this and we weren't sure that an absolute prohibition was essentially what was being sought. And obviously we'll be looking for some direction on that uh, going forward. Uh, in terms of the comments about what to do with existing structures, um, uh, Mr. Pink is correct. We've had this conversation. It, it is a piece that's not included within the official plan and we've written them uh, for others. It just didn't happen to make it into this draft. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, where uh, structures are an existing floodplain uh, and there is a desire to rebuild, then the rebuilding comes with a whole series of conditions that are essentially intended to minimize uh, the impact of, of the structure on the floodplain itself and the, and the impact of flooding on whatever is happening within that structure. Um, in the absence of there being a conservation authority in, in, in Muskoka Lakes, typically in parts of Ontario where there is one, that's what they do primarily through their permitting process is deal with rebuilds like that and so on going forward. Uh, so something obviously for the long term uh, to, uh, to, to consider. Last comment I'll make is with respect to site plan control. When someone applies for a building permit to do something, it's very difficult uh, unless you negotiate with them over the counter in terms of getting the best uh, product at the end of the day that minimizes impacts and so on, through the site plan process, you can basically codify a discussion on how the boathouse is to be um, mapped out, managed and used. And then the landowner enters into an agreement that acknowledges what his obligations are. So we think it's a good idea to incorporate site plan control as a requirement. Yes, it's a new requirement, but it allows for a broader conversation between the township and uh, someone wishing to redevelop or develop a boathouse on what is appropriate, what works, and it's much easier to enforce than a zoning bylaw, to be quite frank, because it's a legal agreement that's registered on title. Uh, that's where I'll stop on those points, but I thought I'd add that in at this point, Chair Bridgman. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. McDonald. Uh, Councillor Mazan. Thank you, and through you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, two comments. First of all, um, if we are contemplating, and I agree, I think we need to be thinking about flood hazards beyond just boathouses. So the idea of homes and other structures on land. Do we also need to consider infrastructure? So roads, bridges, dams, uh, because those are also, I would imagine, uh, appropriate under a flooding hazard. So that's question number one. I think the simple answer is yes. Um, with, with new floodplain mapping available, certainly when the district or the township undertakes any public works, they would be aware of that. And what we typically see when this new mapping comes out, if there's a rebuild or something happening, the, the elevation of the road rises. Uh, just so it's above that elevation. So yes, that's something I think would happen in a normal course, uh, but certainly something uh, we can include in the official plan. Uh, but I think it would happen anyways. Okay, thank you. And then second, just because of the discussion we're having, if I look to 3F and it has guidance material on how to build and alter boathouses in a manner that is supportive of lake system health, should it be any structure? Um, I'm just going to scroll to that section right now. Uh, that section, uh, yes, so I guess we could put that in there. The direction was certainly, uh, when we talked about it, uh, dealing only with boathouses and not with all other types of, uh, of structures. I suppose it could apply to any structure within a floodplain. Um, and I think we would be okay with that moving forward because the rules would be basically the same. Uh, certainly it would be, it may be a little different if it's habitable versus non-habitable, but we can certainly look at that. So I would agree with that, certainly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, something new, Mr. Clark? Just a quick comment. So, um, and it's really a question for David, probably. Uh, David, how many of the new boathouses that you're seeing, <clears throat> single story or or two story that have storage areas, um, do you believe are being used maybe as a percentage other than storage areas? And um, doesn't that give us a pretty good indicator as to number one, what people want and probably why we're not getting a big uptick on requests for sun shelters. Uh, clearly sun shelters are 
not necessarily adequate for what people are looking for. In the handful of sun shelters that I've seen or been requested to build, they're asking for the exact same things. They want appliances, they want cupboards, they want you know things to be able to serve people, et cetera, uh, and enjoy uh, the waterfront, as Phil said. So I, I again, I think I think the problem that we're having is is because people aren't asking for certain things that we're allowing. That may be a very good indicator that that's not what they want, and what we're getting designed and what the architects are designing up uh, for what people ultimately end up getting are just people that are way smarter than us figuring out how to get around the rules and do them in. Um, so the question is, do you want a revenue stream or, or, or again, do you want to have a legal um, process? Because that, those are the, really the two choices ultimately. And I'm not, not being dramatic, but I mean, I haven't been asked to build a boathouse that doesn't have um, a, a lower level area that I suppose will be used for something different than um, storing a canoe. So anyway, that's final input. Right, so are you looking for an answer for Mr. Pink on that? Yeah, I'd be interested if there's, if there's storage below, how many people are we going to be running around enforcing them to take their couches and TVs out of their current boathouse and letting them know it's not allowed um, and, and how many designs are you getting where you're getting fish cleaning stations <laughs> requested. <laughs> Mr. Pitt. Um, thank you, Chair, uh, through you. I, I certainly don't have any uh, firm statistics or detailed numbers uh, off the top of my head, but I, I can anecdotally say that yes, there's certainly I have uh, noticed a large amount of boathouses proposed in the recent past uh, will include a fish cleaning station. They will also include um, a portion of the interior of the boathouse, if not the entire interior of the boathouse that will not have an open slip. Um, I think the, uh, I don't think that's probably a surprise to many. I think the question is not so much, um, we might know what the community wants. I think the proper debate or question is what's uh, appropriate with respect to flooding hazards um, and councils uh, wish for the character and uh, an appearance of our shorelines and use of them and, uh, and the planners can certainly draft uh, policy as appropriate so i, I think it's uh, in response to member clark i think it's fairly clear uh, yes what a number of boathouses wish to have uh, again what i'd also point out is uh, this isn't a, a new initiative the current zoning bylaw doesn't allow living space in any boathouses um, so the fact that people are finding uh, unique ways around that uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's a uh, uh, appropriate. Um, we can certainly change our bylaws and policies to close those loopholes if, if that is what committee wishes. Hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm at Councillor Nishikawa. Obviously, I want to hear from you, but I, I don't think debating this at this stage is where we really want, want to go. It needs to go out to the public to get the public input and then come back and spend the time on it. I just want to pop that in there. Um, Councillor Nishikawa. Well, in fact, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to speak at all at this meeting, but I will say that I, listening to some of the conversations, I think we're being very disrespectful, suggesting that um, I, I've worked on the lake for 30 years. I built a lot of boathouses. I work with clients that are completely respectful of the bylaws, they do all of the proper applications. They don't try to stretch it. And as a matter of fact, one in particular, who is, I'll just say, you know, over the top wealthy for, for many people, keep everything as modest as possible. Their, their footprint is very small. Uh, and I, I, I think having the comments that we're gonna, well, first of all, I was really concerned. One comment I heard that, in fact, some it, it almost made me think that we're passing bylaws to make sure that we get a check at the end of the day sort of thing. Like as in the municipality has funds coming in. It, 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 I have never made any decisions whether we would get more taxes or any of that type of thing. But I, I will say that there are a, a lot larger majority than just a few. I'm not going to say few, but... Um, uh, respectfully, 
there's more developers out there, there's more builders out there that, that are actually working for clients that are respectful for our rules and bylaws and the protection of the natural environment. And I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Chair Bridgman, if I've overstepped my bounds, but I, I just don't like the direction that these conversations have gone because we're forgetting a whole different, we're hearing about some that want all this, but we're not talking about those that actually follow the rules and are, are pleased with what they can have. Sorry. Oh, no, please don't be sorry. I think we need to hear all the input, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Uh, at this point, and I don't see any hands up, but I was going to cut off the boathouse part at this point anyway. <laughs> so so we, I'm sure it'll come back again when we get the next draft. Um, so Mr. McDonald, would you like to carry on? Certainly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so moving on to policy direction uh, number uh, four, dealing with the protection of natural heritage features. This one's pretty straightforward in terms of what the direction is all about and how we've implemented it. Uh, so this policy direction uh, required us to up to include updated natural heritage policies in the official plan uh, with those policies coming from the district's official plan. Uh, so we've done that in sections D1.2 and D1.3. They're pretty extensive sections are quite detailed. Um, they are quite similar to what is in the district's plan, uh, but they, uh, in my view, represent the most up-to-date uh, policy language uh, that we use as it relates to natural heritage features and each of uh, each of the natural heritage features and areas that we deal with in the official plan. The, the second one is probably the, the one that uh, goes a bit further than uh, perhaps uh, uh, the local official, the, the current official plan does, and that deals with the establishment of a local natural heritage system. Uh, according to the provincial policy statement, there is no requirement to establish a natural heritage system on lands on the Canadian shield. It's basically in recognition uh, that the, the natural areas on the shield are quite extensive. Uh, there are uh, considerable undeveloped areas already on the shield. Um, and that is partially the basis uh, for the policy. It doesn't require it. Uh, but there was lots of discussion through the policy direction phase about there being a natural heritage system uh, within the uh, township of Muskoka Lakes. So we've included a new section in your official plan, uh, section D1.5, uh, that sets up uh, the need, sorry, or that uh, sets up the desire to establish a natural heritage system. So the section starts off by saying one isn't required, but one is desired. It goes on to identify what the components of that system are, and they would include, in addition to the natural heritage and features and areas we already know about, um, uh, would include linkage areas and enhancement areas. And we've actually included specific policies on both linkages and enhancement areas in this new section. Um, and we've also included uh, reference uh, to uh, vegetation protection zones uh, being a new requirement uh, wherever an environmental impact study has been uh, completed, uh, such that if someone is doing uh, a development requires an EIS, uh, there would be a need in some cases for them to protect an area adjacent to the feature from development uh, through that process. Uh, the key element of, of all of this is when all of this would happen. Uh, we indicated early on uh, that developing a natural heritage system was not part of the overall official plan review. Um, so we've included a policy that indicates that uh, work um, would begin on developing such a local system within three years. Three years is kind of arbitrary, but we thought we should put a number to it because I think there was an expectation that it would happen. Um, and since it isn't happening now, we thought it was appropriate to do that. So being initiated within three years doesn't mean adopted in three years. It could take two years to do the work, so to speak. Uh, but we felt it was important uh, that it be initiated in a timely manner. Any questions on how we've uh, incorporated this policy direction? Well, I don't see any, and I see Ms. Walton is here. So perhaps, uh... Um, can we just hold your question, Patricia, and then we'll let Ms. Walton do her thing, and then we'll um, we'll come back to this. That's all right. So we're just waiting for Ms. Walton to come in.
I'm still trying to connect to audio here, I see. There she is. Welcome, Ms. Walton. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you very much and welcome. And uh, I know this is a delegation uh, uh, that you have right now. And um, as I, I stated before, and I just want to restate yes. it's that we have a two minute limit, which I'm sure you're aware of. So please um, welcome and uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. I'm having endless internet problems this morning. Um, so I, um, I won't take much of your time. I know you have a heavy agenda. I'm speaking on behalf of our Muskoka, a group of local business owners and residents who are interested in planning matters in the township and are concerned about the official plan process. We've already introduced this group to council, but I also wanted to introduce them to the members of the working committee. And I also wanted to advise you that our Muskoka has initiated a consultation process to ensure that there's a broad understanding of what is being proposed in the official plan and of the implications. And there's been an extremely strong response to this. Our Muskoka has confirmed that many residents in the township have no idea of what is being proposed or how it will impact the enjoyment of their property. What our Muskoka wants to do is help to change this lack of understanding. So we have been retained at Planscape to provide them with planning advice. Our Muskoka did provide input on the policy direction adopted by Council in October 2020 and will be providing a response on this draft of the official plan. My clients feel that the current policies in place in the official plan are actually quite good and sufficient with a bit of tweaking and a little more enforcement to protect the environment while respecting property rights. They are interested in seeing the balance in the policies that focuses on all aspects of the community and addresses the concerns of all who live and work in the township. There are different ways of doing things. What is before you in draft one appears to be just more of what has been in place with strengthening of the policies that will remove a great number of current property rights, result in more process, and in our opinion, less ability to foster what differentiates Muskoka Lakes from other waterfront areas. Our Muskoka has and will continue to provide input on alternative approaches and we look forward to a dialogue on this, these other options as this process moves forward. So thank you very much. I just wanted to provide that update for your information. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Walden. Any questions from committee? I'm not seeing any, so I want to thank you for your time, Ms. Walden. And thank you for your patience. Okay, no, no problem. IT problems are awful, I know. So good luck. Thank okay, you. <laughs> thank you. All right, so Patricia, maybe we can get back to the um, natural heritage features and you have a comment or a question. I have a question about uh, D1.1 item H, which says discourage the introduction of planting or use of invasive non-native species to minimize their impact. Um, I, I think discourage is a rather weak word when we're talking about invasive uh, species and plants. And uh, let me jump down to page 39. I apologize. In D161, uh, cumulative impacts. Um, I again, I am concerned about the language that indicates things like where possible, um, and the whole section E. I would appreciate some explanation on because I'm having difficulty, quite honestly, understanding it. But I, I really don't know how, what situation in which cumulative Im impacts couldn't be reviewed um, as opposed to where possible. Thank you. 
So Mr. McDonald, I think that's number five, our cumulative impacts. So back to number four, because I know um, Ms. Arney had a comment about that. Anything from you? Um, certainly uh, in response, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, discourage isn't uh, as strong, certainly as prohibit. I guess discourage does provide a little bit of flexibility, but on the other hand, uh, introducing non-native species is never a good idea, but it does happen. So we'll, we'll certainly take a look at those words uh, moving forward. I'd be happy to address the cumulative impact uh, discussion unless there is anything else on natural heritage. All right, with cumulative impacts, um, I'm gonna ask uh, Jim to weigh in, but one comment uh, uh, I'll, I'll make at the outset is determining when to look at cumulative impacts is, is, is always a challenge. And we use words like where appropriate because it's very difficult in advance to determine when cumulative impacts are an issue. Um, I know in some other official plans, uh, cumulative impacts are a consideration whenever major development is proposed and major is then defined. And then there is a requirement to look at it. We haven't made an attempt to do that here and perhaps we could, uh, but certainly there are applications which are relatively minor. They may require a minor variance or site plan approval, but because they're so minor, uh, there wouldn't be a need to look uh, beyond the particular property. So that's why we use where appropriate, just based on our experience. Um, I'm gonna ask Mr. Diamond to weigh in on when he sees uh, these kinds of uh, considerations being uh, brought to bear with an application and perhaps even with a few examples. Great. If I, um, sorry, uh, Jim, if I could just clarify, it doesn't say where necessary, it says where possible. And I'm questioning possible. Okay, I think I think my answer will be where possible probably means where appropriate, or actually it doesn't probably, it means the same thing. And I do recall a comment from an earlier meeting that uh, we should be using consistent words all the way through and where possible and where appropriate are, are the same in my view, and we should just pick one and, and run with it. Um, but it does mean the same thing. If I can just speak uh, quickly to it. Um, I chose the word possible because where we don't have any older baseline data, we can't compare what the cumulative impacts are going to be. So if we're looking at a plan for developing on a small lake and the result of the development is going to be, well, these 30 units are going to increase the uh, overall phosphorus concentration on the lake from 10.2 uh, to 10.8. Um, that's information that we can use and someone can say, well, it's less than a less than a 10% impact. But without looking at the studies that happened the last time someone said there would be less than a 10% impact and the time before that, when someone said there'd be less than a 10% impact, you can use this argument that it's, it's a small impact and not realize that over time you are going to change, biologically change the quality of the water. The, um, the language in this section, and I'm reading it always and thinking, yes, we could improve it a little bit in places. Um, but we also talk about the social impact. So I don't know um, how many boating impact studies you've looked at that said, well, it's just going to increase the number of uh, boat trips by 10%. But it's, again, the fourth boating impact study in that part of a lake or whatever that said it's going to increase the boating uh, activity by 10%. And in one shot, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but over time it does. So what this policy is going to require uh, in E would be that where there is historic studies done, where there is data that has been collected over time, that will have to be considered in the overall um, impact reports to talk about the environmental and social impacts and what, what, the, what the baseline is. Um, the municipality has pretty darn good record keeping and now that we're in the digital world it's even better and it should be possible to do this and that's uh, the idea. Uh, follow up or are you good? Uh, if, if, if I may please. Sure. Um, we did not have a discussion on the boating impact studies. We had lengthy discussions on recreational carrying capacity. But I am aware that there are very different ways of doing boating impact studies. 
And I'm wondering, uh, the methodology, is the township going to suggest one methodology um, or where each or either should be used? Um, if you could clarify that for me, I'd appreciate it. That may uh, be Mr. Mr. McDonald or Mr. Dunnett. Uh, certainly, the, the township already has uh, a boating impact study uh, uh, requirement in its official plan. Uh, we've basically carried forward um, those policies into the new plan. We haven't talked to this group about boating impact studies, and perhaps that could be uh, something that gets added in uh, at the end. Uh, Mr. Pink, anything to add to that? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, as you've noted, that policy currently exists. Um, I believe it was uh, put in the current draft uh, in identical form as the, as the current uh, OP, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions if there are on that policy. Okay, um, Member Thompson, Lori? Uh, yes, I just have another question that relates to what Patricia was talking about um, and and also what uh, what Mr. Diamond was talking about with respect to whether these policies apply only to environmental stressors and, and environmental cumulative impacts or whether they're meant to also include the social cumulative impacts. And if so, then I think they might need slight redrafting because it looks like the where social is is mentioned is under policy B but it starts with you know, multiple environmental stressors can impact social systems and so on and so forth. So if we do mean to also have some mechanism for measuring cumulative social impacts, then um, I think it just needs to be made clearer and perhaps separate from the environmental impacts because they are two quite different things. I think just to answer very quickly, I think that's uh, that's a change uh, we can certainly make. Uh, it certainly is implied in the policies, but we can make that much more explicit. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, under this section, consider, uh, consideration of cumulative impacts, I guess I'm gonna do a bit of wordsmithing on this and I apologize for it, but in, uh, in B, that last sentence, I don't see the value of that being in an official plan. Everything we do is going to be difficult. So I think that, um, that, that says, however, it is recognized that measuring and assessing community impact of development environment and overall quality of life uh, is, is challenging. Yeah, so take it out, uh, in my opinion. Um, the next one, where possible, I think in this case, it, it, it should be both, where possible and or appropriate in this case. And, and, uh, and, uh, and finally, in the end of that uh, section C, we'll be like, likewise encouraged. And I, why wouldn't we just say, we'll be assessed? Uh, why, why are we uh, saying like, likewise encouraged? That's uh, what my comments on this section, thank you. Mr. McDonald? Yeah, certainly those are those are good comments. I think the likewise encouraged is probably not the best uh, official plan language because it's not really that directive. So we'll certainly look at that. I think what that section was trying to get at is that where possible um, studies done by public agencies or the watershed uh, Muskoka Watershed uh, uh, Group uh, would certainly help in assessing individual studies as they come along. So I think that's what that was trying to do. Uh, but we'll look at that wording and uh, clean that up. Uh, saying something as challenging as kind of saying it's difficult to, to do. And, and is that really what we want to say in an official plan? Probably not. Um, so I, I agree with you, Councillor Roberts, on that point. Okay, I am not seeing any other hands up at this point. So I believe we can move on to the next section, Mr. McDonald. Great, uh, we've, uh, we've gone through almost four of them. That's pretty good today so far. Um, I'm going to suggest again, uh, Chair Bridgman, that around 2.30, we take a 10 minute break. Uh, so policy direction number six uh, deals with uh, watershed planning. There was certainly a lot of discussion uh, about that uh, through uh, this, uh, this process. So I'm gonna go through very quickly what we've done. 
so firstly, policy direction says uh, that there should be policies in the official plan that uh, recognize the sustaining and restoring the resilience of ecosystems and watersheds is required to address climate change impacts. And within this particular section, and I'm not going to go through all of them, there are multiple references to climate change and resilience and ecosystem planning, natural heritage system planning uh, throughout uh, the document. And uh, I've only picked a few here uh, to focus in on. One of the more significant changes in the official plan globally is, is an increased and enhanced requirement for stormwater management and best management practices to be applied in virtually all cases. And that is certainly being codified uh, within the official plan. And of course, we also have enhanced system, enhanced policies on lake system health, which we've also talked about, which get at uh, the resilience issue uh, going forward. Uh, part B uh, talks about uh, uh, including policies to support the development of natural heritage system, which we've already talked about, um, and water resource system mapping that leads to improved knowledge and the characterization of subwatersheds in Muskoka Lakes. So we've incorporated a policy on, on that uh, within section D15, where we talk about the need to initiate a natural heritage system planning process uh, in, uh, uh, in three years. Uh, third, or item C, enhanced uh, policies on stormwater management. And we have included uh, quite a number of new policies and requirements on stormwater management that is to be applied wherever a planning application is submitted, including a site plan approval. Um, certainly my understanding that currently the township is requiring uh, enhanced protection measures um, through this process already. We're just codifying that and making it a requirement in all cases. Uh, item D, include a schedule in the official plan showing the major watersheds in the township. Unfortunately, we didn't get to that before preparing this draft, so there will be a map prepared uh, that, do sh uh, that uh, does show where those watersheds are, and it will be an appendix to the plan, so you'll see that in the second draft. Uh, e, again, deals with stormwater management, a little bit repetitive, uh, but it gets at what we're trying to achieve, which is minimize stormwater volumes and contaminant loads, and we've included references to those in uh, uh, section D41. Uh, include policies that support preparation of master environmental servicing plans. Uh, that was something that was discussed uh, through the Minette process as an example. Uh, so we've included a new section M10 uh, that specifically requires what we're calling comprehensive development plans, which is also a term used in the district's plan. And we certainly see that being a requirement for major resort and uh, uh, development and redevelopment and potentially other forms of development as well. And we can certainly talk about that when we get there. Um, and then lastly, uh, include policies that support the entering into partnerships with the district and other public bodies, bodies and of course, the Muskoka Watershed Council, uh, who were active participants in the district official plan preparation process. Uh, so we've done that in section D2.5b, where we also refer to the Muskoka Watershed Council. Are there any questions about how we've implemented this policy direction? Mitty, any questions at all? I'm not seeing any, I just about didn't see any. Mr. Scalati, you'd like to go ahead, David? Uh, yes, Chair, I was just wondering if anywhere in section we need to be specific or if the uh, bylaws will take care of it. I'm thinking about hardscaping uh, requirements as to what percentage is allowed to be covered. And I know we're talking about storm water, but there's also man-made water. For instance, I may want to empty my swimming pool in the all and it, it put it right into the river or lake that I happen to be on. So I'm just wondering if we need to have anything about that kind of thing here or if that's just covered somewhere else in the bylaws, for instance. Thanks. Uh, through you to uh, to Mr. Sculati, um, we did talk about uh, about uh, updated site alteration uh, policies at our last meeting. That would certainly get at the issue of hardscaping, uh, in my view. Although I think uh, those policies would benefit from the inclusion of that specific word, just so that there's some clarity on that, because hardscaping can mean different things to different uh, different people. Um, I think as well too that the enhanced stormwater management policies do deal 
uh, with what you're uh, talking about. Um, I also know that uh, some municipalities have actually prepared guidelines for these kinds of plans to be done, um, where you would get into much more detail about what you're expecting in a stormwater management plan or a best management practices plan going forward. But I think we've got a good running start in the policies we've developed uh, to, to require all of that to be considerations. Uh, but certainly again, as, uh, as, as indicated earlier, uh, we're always interested in making enhancements if there's a need to do so to the policies to make that clear. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, through you. Um, just building on something that David said about emptying pools and hot tubs, um, is there anywhere in the uh, watershed planning where we address pesticides, insecticides, and neonicotinoids? Mr. McDonald? Yeah, I'm just thinking not directly. Um, it's, a, it's a good point. I don't think I can give you an answer uh, right off the top, but certainly would be a consideration. Uh, leave that for us, unless Mr. Diamond or Mr. Pink has anything to add to that, but we don't deal with that issue directly. We certainly do deal with non-invasive species and so on, um, but we don't get at the issue of, of insects. I don't think the Planning Act has any enabling uh, language that could be affected by this. This is a municipal act um, issue, um, but we can think about it and there's certainly nothing wrong having policies that support a municipal act bylaw. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I, I think this is where we should be applied. E422, B, it talks about na natural vegetated shorelines and we all want to encourage them. I have no problem with that. But in B, it says the vegetated buffer should stretch the entire water frontage and be at least 15 meters in depth from the normal high water mark. I don't, I think that's contra contrary to even our 75% expectation of, of a buffer. I'm just looking for clarification there. Uh, certainly, I'll start off. And uh, yes, you're right. Uh, that expectation is there for 75% of the water frontage. And in fact, we actually had that in an initial draft. Uh, but when Mr. Pink saw it, he said, no, uh, we've been asking folks to go right across the uh, front end of the lot as, as, as an basically as an encouragement policy. And they've been working with folks through the site plan approval process to achieve just that. So we thought it was important to be aspirational uh, and, and include that requirement within the policies. Mr. Pink, perhaps you can comment on that. Mr. Pink. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I believe, I can't speak for the other area municipalities uh, for certain, but I believe um, in the district plan and the other area municipalities, they do allow uh, a percentage, approximately 25% of their shorelines to be altered and opened. Uh, the township has required a continuous shoreline vegetative buffer across its entire frontage uh, for quite some time. Uh, we, uh, as Mr. McDonald noted, we very strictly uh, monitor and enforce that uh, through tree preservation bylaws and the existing site plan agreements. I wouldn't recommend that we waiver uh, from that. We have required a buffer and I think it uh, has served us well. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Okay, uh, anyone else? Okay, Mr. McDonald, I think we're finished with that section. Great. So the next one is the community planning permit system. Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about that when we were developing uh, the policy directions and uh, lots of pro and con conversation. And essentially we all concluded that it really wasn't the time and place to figure out whether we wanted a community planning uh, permit system established. Um, so instead it was agreed that we would include policies in the OP uh, that would enable the use of a permit system uh, down the road. So we've done just that in section M3, it's a very short section. 
I anticipate, practically speaking, that if the township was ever interested in going down this road, it probably would have to amend the official plan anyways to establish uh, more detailed criteria, uh, identify the community planning permit area, and so on. Uh, so certainly is something the township can do uh, at its own, uh, at a time of its own choosing. Uh, we also indicated that we didn't need to include anything in here to enable it to occur, but everyone thought it was a good idea to do that. So we have, and it's quite simple, and it's reflected in section M3. So Mr. Diamond, I see you there. Would you like to say something? I just wanted to add uh, for um, those that are participating in the meeting, that the town of Huntsville is currently doing this now. Um, uh, while Lake of Bays has done it for uh, over a decade, um, Huntsville has decided to replace its zoning bylaw with a development permit bylaw, and they're just in the process of doing it. Um, so it will be a good uh, experience to learn from Huntsville and see whether or not Muskoka Lakes is interested in it down the road. Yeah, it went, we, we will investigate it, I'm sure, going forward. Uh, Mr. Clark? Thank you. Um, based on everything else that we're trying to put in here, I don't even see how this could be negotiable. Um, I think some of the simpler tasks that need to go through minor variants um, even some of our consents where we're getting uh, complete agreement from township planning, who are the experts that we rely on. We have neighbors that are in agreement. Uh, we have extended neighbors that are in agreement. Um, there's just too many times I've been involved in these where subjective things start coming in um, that actually have nothing to do with our planning, our OP or our bylaws. And we start getting commentary that has actually nothing to do with the application. Um, and that tends to start swaying um, where people as part of these councils or approval networks um, are, are actually uh, weighing in and voting against things that our own township planners are approving. So um, at a bare minimum, um, you know, if everything is going to go to site plan approval, which is what we're discussing and again, vehemently oppose, um, I just don't know how you're going to do it. <laughs> and uh, if we're going to have any kind of economy here whatsoever, um, I think we better start getting out of the box and start thinking about how we're, how we're going to get things approved to move forward. And uh, it's not even, you know, I can weigh in on that, but I think uh, uh, Director Hammond could as well, because I think we need to understand what that plan looks like to deal with all these permits that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to suggest rather than start a whole discussion on this here, uh, your points are well taken, Mr. Clark. When, if, and when the township ever gets to actually looking at this, certainly your input would be invaluable. I'm not sure. Uh, all we're doing now is a placeholder in terms of the official plan. So uh, unless I really run into opposition on that from anybody, uh, point well taken. Going forward, it would be a great discussion, but I think we're just going, to, we're not going to, I don't believe we're going to take this out of going to the public, so we could just leave it where it is right now. Mr. McDonald? Great. Uh, turning to the next policy direction, it's a, a broad one dealing with intensification in urban centers. Uh, there's a lot in this policy direction, uh, and all of it is really designed uh, to encourage uh, the township to be more open to a broader mix and range of uses uh, within the two urban centers um, and to, uh, I guess, establish new policies that are very encouraging of that. Uh, we did uh, incorporate uh, that policy direction by establishing a target uh, for intensification within the urban centers with that target coming from the district's plan and that's in section C2 uh, sub D and that's 10%. And then we did a fairly extensive rewrite of the urban center policies in part I of the official plan. And there's quite a bit in there uh, that is supportive of, of additional intensification within the urban centers. Uh, for example, we've, we've increased uh, permitted densities to some extent. Uh, we've directed that the zoning bylaw uh, permit a wider range of uses when the, when the bylaw is updated. Uh, following the approval of this official plan and so on. I don't plan to go through Part I at this point. It is a very extensive and very detailed section. 
um, but we did uh, incorporate uh, this policy direction uh, as I've uh, just explained. Any questions on that? Any comments, any questions? I am seeing none, Mr. McDonald, so I think we can move on. Great. Uh, next one deals with development in community areas. And I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Diamond to, to explain what he did. Uh, but, but what this policy direction uh, indicated was that instead of not having uh, individual land use designations within the community areas, uh, that efforts be made to actually divide the five community areas into a number of land use designations with uh, uh, related policies, permitted uses, and some standards. Um, so Mr. Diamond uh, uh, was responsible for this component of the official plan. I'm gonna ask him to uh, go through quickly uh, what he did um, with perhaps some reference to the mapping uh, that has been prepared. Mr. Diamond. Thanks, I'll be brief about it. Um, what I did um, through both air photo and on site uh, was to go look at each community and see whether or not there is in my view or which will become our view, um, a, uh, a logical designation within all the communities where the focus of the community core would be, where there would be the commercial activity, um, where the focus of residential activity would be to, um, to ensure that um, they stay essentially residential and to identify uh, existing um, institutional uses that make up uh, the community and in some places identify employment lands within each community. So we tried to keep it to a very simple um, designation within the community, remembering that the objective was to provide a, a greater degree of certainty for those communities than what exists today. Right now, your communities are one designation called a community. And it means that in any of those communities, through rezoning, um, I can make an application to do, put a commercial use in the middle of a residential area. And um, this will make it more difficult to go outside of the designated areas. And that's why it's important for everybody to have a look at it now um, and see whether or not we have done the right thing, but once it's there, it will provide a greater degree of certainty to people within those communities about what type of development occurs there. And just to follow up on uh, what Mr. Diamond indicated, and I don't plan on going through it now, but included within the schedules that you would have been provided as well, are individual schedules for the five community areas, um, starting with schedule C3. So certainly uh, we encourage uh, planning committee and members of the working group to review those schedules uh, as well. If there are comments, uh, please provide them to us. Again, keeping in mind that there are multiple opportunities to, to make those changes uh, going forward. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add to this conversation, and it is uh, included within the, the, the policy direction table, is Walker's Point. Um, there was discussion about Walker's Point uh, through the policy direction uh, uh, component of this process, and there was a desire on the part of, of a number of people uh, for it to be identified as a community area. We have not done that in the draft uh, that we've prepared. We've not mapped it, nor have we identified it as such uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, uh, it can't be identified through this process without it first being identified in the District of Muskoka official plan uh, because a community area is considered to be a settlement area and settlement areas and their boundaries are established in the district plan first. Having said that, uh, I guess we're interested to know what the motivation behind wanting it to be a community area is. So perhaps we can go away and think about that a little more. Our initial thought was uh, based on looking at how Walker's Point is set up, it's quite linear, it's quite spread out. Uh, it, knowing where the boundaries would be, would be an interesting discussion. But I think more importantly, if we did and do include it as a community area, that would mean that perhaps additional development beyond folks would think is appropriate would actually be permitted because that's where development is directed. So we wanted to understand that a little bit more. And, and I know uh, 
Councillor Hayes, uh, you've brought this up earlier. Um, and perhaps before I get there, uh, Mr. Diamond, perhaps you can add to that. Yeah, yeah I will add to it. Um, uh, Councillor Hayes and I spent quite a bit of time on the telephone um, talking about this. And I now have, uh, thank you very much, by the way, a far greater understanding of the desire uh, to have the community designation. Um, so not to, um, not to spend a long time on it. I've undertaken to do a tour with Councillor Hayes uh, sometime this month um, so that I can document things. When I did look at it in the winter, there's a lot of things I couldn't see uh, because of snow banks and, uh, and, and things. Um, so it's work in progress. Okay, Councillor Hayes, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, I was just gonna reiterate what Jim said that we have talked about this. Um, there are things that um, Jim and Nick weren't aware of. And just because something was not, well, it, it, the general consensus is that it was forgotten because there was no representation from this area at that point in time. So just, we're just trying to correct a mistake and um, it's more not why we should, but why not? We have exactly the same um, community set up as the other areas, so. Okay, well, I expect there'll be public input at the input stage too, so that'll be interesting. Um, Lori, member Thompson. Yes, thank you. I have a question under the development policies section, um, J4.1.2. Um, I'm wondering, given that in the urban center policies, you have some really great language about design and character and landscaping and sustainability and so on and so forth. Would it be appropriate to also put that into the community areas development policies? Yeah, having, having some reference to, to urban design and character, I think would be a good idea when, when you look at those communities for what they are, yeah. Okay. Okay. And can I have one? Yeah, go ahead. Question? Yes, no, please. Also with um, the same section, um, J4.1.2 um, under B, I feel uh, you, you're making allowance for um, semi detached and duplex dwellings in, um, I, I assume, in, um, in one building. Are they on their own individual septics? So in these communities, or because these aren't municipally serviced, just my understanding. So how does the how does the this, this septic work for that? If they're under different ownership? Uh, you can go up to five units on a private septic system. Okay. And I can advise you that there have been places that I know of close to the township of Muskoka Lakes where they found that to be a very effective form of affordable housing. Right. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, I don't see anyone else. Mr. McDonald, we could go on or we could take a 10 minute break right now, whatever you'd prefer. Oh, Councillor Edwards just popped up. Just a second, Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at on, on mine on page 95, it's uh, H241 and it's uh, Rural Hamlets. And uh, there's a few there that you, you mentioned, uh, Windermere Corners. Uh, where is Windermere Corners? I'm taking that's D-Bank, which uh, it was an actual, and that uh, community at one time and had a school, a church and mills. And I think that's what you're saying in Three Mile Lake Corners. And I don't see Hecla in there as a hamlet. So can maybe can you explain? Thank you. Mr. Pink, I'm going to defer to, to you on this one because uh, we did have a conversation about this and uh, I think the locations most likely came from you. So I'm going to, going to put this one on you. Okay, so Mr. Pink, so, so this is the rural lot creation, Councillor Edwards, correct? Uh, no, it, it's the actual rural hamlet areas that we've called rural hamlet areas. It's yeah, in a different hamlets. section. Yes, thank you. Okay. It's in a different okay. section, but it's probably worth ta talking about right yeah. now. Yep, yeah. Mr. Pink. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll certainly lean on Mr. Diamond as well. Um, feel free to, to jump in because I know uh, you and I did speak at length about identifying these areas. I think to answer your question, uh, Member Edwards, yes, I believe... Uh, Windermere Corners uh, refers to D-Bank, and I think I, I raised that. Uh, I don't know if it's, I believe it's been earlier mentioned, the, the schedules uh, are a work in progress. 
I think a number of the labels uh, and the schedules and appendices are still being refined with the district of Muskoka. Um, I, I certainly know it as, uh, as D-Bank. Um, I didn't know if there was a, another specific question in there, but I, I thought we did identify Hecla as well as either a residential cluster uh, or a rural hamlet. Um, I have to pull up the, the appendices quickly to confirm. Mr. Donnett? Yeah, um, Hecla is very interesting in that it, it, there is a cluster of, of houses there, but all the lots are very large. Um, so it isn't like there's a cluster of small lots. Um, the other thing that, that Mr. Pink and I were, were kind of looking at in terms of criteria for identifying hamlets is most often there are a mix of residential and commercial and employment uses. And you can find that in just about all of them. Just about all of them also have some kind of an institutional use, um, place of worship or a community center. Um, and so uh, I think the Three Mile Lake Corners uh, for your information is where Muskoka Road 3 meets, uh, not, it's not quite 141 at that point, I think it's still called Manitoba Street, uh, but District Road 4. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a MTO yard there, there's an auto mechanic there, there's a gas station convenience store there. Um, so there's a, and there's a, quite a cluster of houses there. It has- yeah, I that thank you. That's that. That's what the locals call Nine Mile Corner. I thought so. Thank you. So should we call it Nine Mile Corner? <laughs> well, I, it's up to you, but that's that's what the locals. I think it was nine miles from Windermere at the time. Nine Mile Corner. Oh. Okay. Um, so as and as uh, Mr. Pink said, work in progress. Uh, we tried to map them as best we could. Uh, try to update the existing mapping, um, and uh, happy to have any comments on the mapping once we get into that. Hey, thank you. Uh, Mayor Hardy? I uh, think, Madam Chair, just as we go into break, maybe it's, I'm not sure if it's a question for Mr. McDonald, Mr. Pink, or actually I'll even say all of council or yourself as chair, because what I'm, I, I appreciate we're spending a lot of time catching some typos and maybe a little wordsmithing here or there, but I'm, I'm getting the sense that council wants the public to chime in on everything in this document. And if that's the case, I'm just trying to understand our effectiveness going through this today without public input, and then potentially coming back again in six months with public input on the exact same items that would also at the same time catch the typos or anything that way. So um, I, I'm not sure if we can answer that today or not, but I just, I wanna make sure our hours that we spend in this committee are not for naught if we're just going to wait till we hear from the public. If I can add just one thing in response, uh, I, I appreciate your comments. And I, I guess as a consulting team um, and, and your staff, we're here to do whatever you want us to do to ensure you have a complete understanding as a group of what we've done. So I sort of look at these meetings as a way for you to understand the complexity of what goes into writing an official plan and all of the things we have to think about in doing that. And I think it provides a great opportunity for this group to ask questions, uh, become more informed. Uh, and certainly if there are suggestions uh, that we can easily uh, uh, you know, uh, take on and, and improve the document as a consequence, we're happy to take those. But you're quite right, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, there will be multiple opportunities to look at this. And, and that's why I let off today with uh, the statement that perhaps uh, for some of this, it's good to get that public input before we dive in. But again, uh, we're, we're uh, at your beck and call on how we proceed through these meetings and uh, we're here for you and whatever you decide is best is how we'll proceed. Thank you. Well, I, do you want to say something more, Mayor Hardy? Yeah. I'm going to let me let me tell you my my take on it, and then you can say what you did. To me, this is educational. It allows us all to completely understand this, so that when it does go out for public comment, I think we're well versed in what Mr. McDonald's trying to do, what an official plan looks like in terms of the review, and I think there's a level of comfort here. I know we're not agreeing on everything, but at least we all will understand the issues completely. So that, to me, it's very well spent 
time. That just that would be my comment. So, okay, Mayor Harding, back to you. Yeah, sorry, and just and that was my question: Was it to Mr. McDonald or Mr. Pink, or to Council, or to the Chair as to what exactly we wish to do? Um, because ultimately, it will become Council's decision: Do we want to make changes before it goes to the public or not? Um, and, and I appreciate the education of what an official plan is. I know when I listen to the public, I'm going to be soliciting their input to be able to make my decision better versus myself understanding the process of this. But that's just my perspective. So I'll let it go. I just had to put a little stake in the ground. Okay, I have two more on this one and then maybe we can take our break. Um, Patricia? Thank you, I'll be quick. I, I just suggest that maybe we have something else we might learn from Huntsville. They're dealing with tiny homes right now. And uh, I think they're going to come up with a policy. I'm not sure if uh, Township has had any interest, but uh, they're certainly becoming uh, an affordable housing option. Could we add that on to our talk about at the at the end, um, please? Because I I, I agree. Well, I, it's an option we need to look at here, and get some wording in. So if that's okay with you, Patricia, we'll we'll look at that after we've gone through the document. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark? Yeah, just um, just agreeing with Phil. I mean, we're going through, we're talking, a handful of us are talking about plenty of things. Many of us are sitting on our hands. Um, and I'm not being critical. I mean, if you don't have an opinion and you just want to listen and learn, that's great. Um, what I will say is the document we're going through is very different than the document and the things that I felt we were compromising and agreeing on uh, when our committee was working on its own. Um, that document at some point went away with Meridian um, and Council and came back looking very different <laughs> than uh, some of the robust discussion we had as a small group. And as I go through this, what's happened is it's gone to this, as I've said it before, to this sort of extreme um, sort of policy direction. And as we're going through and kind of going back to all of these things that during those, those committee meetings that we were involved in for hours, um, I was assured there wasn't gonna be a lot of, you know, change and some of these things would be incorporated. Um, they aren't. Um, and, um, and yet every um, compromise as it related to bringing forth a stricter document is incorporated. So I agree with Phil, I feel like we're going through, we're talking about things and then we're saying, well, let's just leave that alone and go to the public. We can all read this. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be involved, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a long process to say, let's not, let's not affect a change from something that's gone to the extreme. Thank you. Okay, I uh, thank I appreciate your comment, but um, Mr. Clark, Council hasn't weighed didn't weigh in on this at all. I think you said there that that had happened, and we had not done that. I just wanted to clarify that for you. Yeah. So sorry, maybe the wrong wording. I think what Nick has said is, you know, whenever I brought these comments up, is that well, we've been taking clear direction from Council. So I I don't know in what format that was or what input. Uh, whether that was through this entire group or whether there was other meetings, I, I don't know. Um, but this doesn't resemble uh, a lot. I mean, there's tons of areas where we have massive amounts of agreement and it's very simple. All we're talking about here are areas that we don't agree and we're going, oh, well, let's take that to the public. So uh, again, with two or three people weighing in with, with comments, and generally it's you know extreme side so we've got democrats and republicans working here just so you know most of my friends think i'm a democrat <laughs> wait till you meet them <laughs> anyway take care oh thanks for the humor <laughs> um miss <laughs> lundell um well thank you chair bridgman i mean i i guess i'm getting off my hands right now but um i do feel that we went through this and and this format as this committee uh, special planning committee and that the policy directions were endorsed unanimously at that time so i really appreciate the um 
attempts at all the forms of policy that our consultants have put together with Mr. Pink's input, I'm sure. And uh, I, I think it's good. We are ha having some in-depth discussion on, on some of the more contentious items, but um, we, do, we did unanimously provide direction that these were the types of policies and the direction that this group wanted to go in when we had our last session. Okay. All right. Um, what do you say to a 10 minute break? Everybody I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 25 to three, let's come back. It's 20. Well, we'll come back at, uh, at, at uh, 246 precisely. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, everybody back. Oh, there's our clerk. He's here. And Mr. Mc... <laughs> okay, so Mr. Clerk, we have a quorum back yet. I'm going to start as soon as we do. I think we've got a quorum in terms of councillors. We have that for the committee. Oh, I think so. I'm just counting, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Definitely have a quorum in terms of planning committee, uh, in terms of the OP committee. Just waiting for member clerk, but it looks like. We have everybody else. Nice. I don't see member Lundell. Okay, so we need one of the two of those. Yes, ma'am. Actually, I think we're good now. I see uh, Member Thompson. So we've got three out of the five. Okay, well then let's keep going. Uh, the others can join us when they get back. And so, Mr. McDonald, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Bridgman. So we're now moving on to uh, rural lock creation. Uh, pretty simple uh, policy direction, uh, but has uh, certainly some implications. Uh, the first part of it uh, said that uh, there should be policies that permit estate development in appropriate locations subject to an official plan amendment. Uh, we've done that in section H212K. Uh, the second one was more substantive in that it dealt with uh, rural law creation. And what we took is a what I would call a patchwork quilt of rural law creation policies based on geography and created one uh, law creation rule um, that applies in the rural area. And basically the minimum lot area would be uh, two, hectare with a, two hectares with 150 meters of frontage. Um, that rule is applied across the board and includes, uh, and, and there are policies which require consideration of the uh, impacts on the environment, impacts on the road system, uh, services, and other things as well. So section 8 H212 uh, contains those updated policies, um, and I'll get to the local agricultural area designation in a moment. Now, Mr. Diamond was responsible for looking at the existing policies and uh, and providing an updated uh, policy framework. And perhaps if Mr. Diamond has anything to add, he can add uh, to what I've just said before we take any questions. Uh, very quickly, and I'm uh, remembering uh, Councillor Roberts' request that we had a track version change of the official plan to show what's changed and was thinking not in this section, we can't do that. Um, right now, your current official plan has no less than six different lot creation policies in the rural area. It's just too complicated and too confusing. Um, and so we've greatly simplified it, but I think also provided opportunities for rural lot creation uh, and uh, um, simplified the policies and broadened the uses a little bit to allow for more um, home industries and home occupations uh, and things like that in the rural area. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, answer questions as they may come. Okay, I don't see any. So I actually, if I could, Mr. McDonald, just based on our chat, just before we finished here, I would like to get a read from this entire committee. Uh, these policies were put in place because the majority of our, of, of this, of these working group and the planning committee, this was the direction given. So that's why these policies are here. And I am I guess I need to ask now, is our current format, are you finding this helpful as a committee? We have it here as, as uh, Mayor Harding and Mr. Clark said, do we need to go through this step-by-step? Step? 
before it goes out to the public. Would you like to just have your questions answered or um, mine would probably be if we could just go through the document with the explanation, that would be very educational for me. So there's a few options here that I thought only fair that I give the committee the, the um, ability to let me know what we would like to do in terms of this and stay, stay the course, it's helpful or shorten it up a little because we will be coming back to discuss all of this, that, that part is true. But, okay, Patricia? Thank you. Um, just a concern about um, H213. I think we all heard from uh, Ken Riley. Um, agricultural activities will not be permitted within 150 meters of a water body. Um, that means there would be no agricultural activity in Muskoka, essentially, unless we clarify what a water body reference is. And, um, so I uh, leave that to the... Very quickly on that point, uh, what we did in this section is actually copied exactly word for word what's in the existing official plan. So this is something that was in there. Uh, to be honest, when I saw that, I said, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, so I, we did carry it forward. So I'm more than happy to take that out. Uh, if, if there was a concern about agricultural activity, it might be more related to livestock uses than anything else. Uh, but if they were proposed, uh, they would have to go through a series of calculations that would require them to be set back from sensitive uses. So I'm certainly content to take that out uh, subject to anything that Mr. Pink may want to add to that because it is in the current official plan. Okay, I don't think Mr. Pink wants to, needs to add anything at, at this point. So, okay, Councillor Hayes. Thank you. I'm just going to fall back on something that uh, Councillor Edwards had mentioned earlier, and that is um, everything is in hectares and meters, and I'm trying to quickly convert it <laughs> in my head so that, um, not that I'm showing my age, but most of what I deal with is in, in feet and acres. So that would be, what would the frontage be on 150 meters? compared to what it is now. Okay, uh, Mr. Pink. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just quickly commenting on the last point in the uh, rural waterfront interface, uh, would just add that uh, Mr. McDonald's correct, that's word for word. Uh, I don't think, I think some of the concern or the confusion in the public is that it's from any type of water course, whether it's a small stream or a pond on a property. Uh, I think if you look at that closely, the waterfront designation extends 150 meters back uh, from our uh, large water bodies and it does not permit agricultural uses this OP certainly wouldn't be able to prohibit an existing farm from continuing to operate, but our current OP wouldn't allow a new farm in the waterfront designation in any event. So I think there's just some misunderstanding there. Uh, I'll just very quickly highlight the rural policies because you've heard Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond say they're very confusing. Um, there's portions of our community that are extremely restrictive in the rural area, 600 feet in 10 acres. I'll use the Imperial for those, uh, hopefully that benefits. Um, and also, You've heard me say before, um, in those areas where it's 600 feet and 10 acres, we limit lot creation to only one new lot per land holding as of 1992. So if you split a lot off as a rural landowner in 1993, you could have 10,000 feet of frontage and 1,000 acres. The OP would say no more lot creation. You have other parts of our township that allow us down to 325 feet and two and a half acres and less restriction on the number of lots you can create. Then intermingled with that, you have uh, agricultural rural areas, which are even more confusing that I won't even get into because I think it'll just confuse everyone even more. What we've done instead of 325 feet, two and a half acres, 600 feet and 10 acres, we've sort of met in the middle because I've heard many times over the years that the 600 feet and 10, 10 acres with a limit on the number is very restrictive. And yet 325 feet and two and a half acres is probably a little too permissive in the other parts. So we've somehow uh, tried to simplify, met in the middle at 500 feet and five acres. 
and we've gone with a more merit-based approach as opposed to a strict one lot per land holding as of 1992. So I think my impression of the policy direction discussions was that there was a wish to loosen the rural policies a little bit, encourage more uh, rural development as potentially a form of attainable housing, um, but also uh, recognizing uh, estate planning uh, and succession planning for our rural landowners. So I would say uh, the rural policies have been uh, loosened slightly, uh, perhaps gotten a little uh, more stringent in a small or some part of our uh, rural area, uh, but a general balancing and uh, happy to say a simplification because uh, even staff struggles uh, pre-consulting with property owners as to what rates they, they have in our rural area. Uh, I think this uh, simplifies it. So hopefully that high level overview provides the background the committee was looking for. Um, happy to change to metric if, if anyone needs. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pink. Um, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll come back to your question of sort of where we wanna go with this, either high level or not. The one thing that continues to be missing for me, and sorry, let me back up because there's been questions about where our committee provided policy direction. And, you know, Ms. Clark saying that's not what we're seeing here today and we're seeing too much. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that this council, this committee provided policy direction um, and unanimously in all of these areas. I don't doubt that, but it'd be the same kind of thing saying, hey, it would be really nice if we built a new building or a new cottage or a new building over on the Cleveland South property. That'd be really great policy direction. And all of a sudden it comes back and it's 34 stories and has density of 4,000 units. We're all gonna stand back and say no. And I think that's what we're experiencing. That's what I'm experiencing today with the cumulative impact of a lot of these uh, implications in a lot of the different areas. And so what I would love, and I said this a couple of times ago, but to fully understand and, and comprehend the quantified changes, you know, when we go from a development of a 200 foot lot to a 300 foot lot, oh, so that's two to 300. Well, it's 33% more on a water frontage lot, add to a back lot. How much bigger is it when we add additional dimensions to it? What are the theoretical restrictions we're putting on properties. And that's what I would really like to understand. And I appreciate we want to get public input. Um, again, I'm not sure about council. I'm already getting a ton of public input. And this draft isn't even out there. And again, I will come back to what our council has said many, many times. And, and I tend to agree a little bit. I want to get this pretty close to the public's idea versus the public just shooting something down because it is a council document at the end of the day when council agrees to put this forward and our planning committee puts this forward to the public for additional input. So what I, I really look forward to at one point, hopefully sooner than later, is a, it doesn't have to be a track change because I understand there are two different documents, but the contemplated changes that are being implied across the board on a number of these issues that weren't there today, the additional studies that are required, the additional site plans that are required, the potential costs associated so that I have a better handle on what uh, TML official plan 2021 actually looks like versus the prior official plan, if that makes sense. So um, I'm not sure when and if that can come forward but that then makes my discussion a little bit more productive, I think. Um, and I'm happy to at times say, I don't need the public's input on this. I think this is too egregious in this particular area. That's my perspective going forward. Okay, so thank you, Mayor Hardy. And I think this is somewhat what the document was that, that Councillor Roberts uh, referred to uh, asking for the last time. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. McDonald and Mr. Pink. I, I, I know there were time constraints in terms of producing it. So I am thinking before we get together after this goes out, if we could have that, that would help. Unless by some miracle, we could have it before the next meeting. <laughs> anyway, I will let you, Mr. McDonald, uh, respond to that. Uh, certainly, Chair Bridgman, uh, certainly uh, uh, respect the comments uh, you're making, Mr. Mayor. I guess the first thing I'll say is that each of the policy directions that were uh, endorsed by council, we have implemented. Uh, 
what probably you weren't or couldn't have been aware of when uh, perhaps some of the policy directions were considered is the cumulative impact of those. We did warn the group a few times, uh, in particular as it related to the waterfront designation, that there would be increased minor variances as a consequence of, of the implications of making these changes. So I think we put that out there. Uh, but to your point, Mayor Harding, uh, we can put something together and I think it wouldn't be too lengthy, but I think we could summarize probably on a couple of pages what the key changes um, that could be perceived as being more restrictive are, just so there is a cheat sheet of shorts, uh, sorts that you can rely on uh, in your deliberations and, and, and discussions. Um, the next meeting is on the 16th. I think we can have that ready for that meeting um, so that we can have a conversation about it. Um, but as I did say at the last meeting, uh, there was a collective desire through the policy direction discussion in my view, to make things more difficult for either environmental or character reasons. And by doing so, sorry, in doing so, it means more applications and more process to get exactly what you're looking for on a case by case basis. And as I mentioned, that means more minor variances, more site plan agreements, uh, more rezonings potentially, and that's what the cumulative impact of all of this is. In the end, development will still happen. It'll just cost a bit more to get there and it'll take more time. So in the end, that's what we have to all, you all as a group have to collectively think about and perhaps make some trade-offs uh, when, when you get to the end of all of this on, in terms of what you really wanna see done. So it's a first step, first draft, uh, but I can assure you, uh, Mr. Mayor, that we did implement each of the policy directions um, now you see it in words and it's like the 40 story example. Of course, you don't see the words when you uh, endorse them, but we did do that. Uh, anyways, we're happy to prepare something like that for the next meeting. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I put my hand up when we were talking about rural lot creation. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, instead um, I will send in my comments and requirements. I believe that we, in fact, and I've been working with uh, a few different groups trying to um, figure out some abilities to uh, find and create um, lots within the rural designations uh, for attainable housing. And it slapped me right in the head when I read that we were going to be uh, changing this, that will make it quite, in fact, very difficult for um, areas around Bala and Port Carling that have rural acreage, because now where they had the, the two and a half acres, it, that's changing. So that makes a big difference, but mostly I will put all of that in writing. And, and um, because I, I also believe much along the line that the, the mayor had said, we have that opportunity to do that. We're not gonna answer anything today. Each of us has our own comments and, um, and I'm just gonna submit mine in writing. I'm not sitting on my hands by the way, but I will submit it by in writing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to speak to um, uh, H22 local agricultural area, and then comment back on the on the agriculture activities in uh, H213E. Um, I've been in conversation with um, representatives of the uh, Muskoka uh, Federation of Agriculture, and they do plan to um, delegate when version two is available uh, for comments, and they'll be. Uh, specifically looking for or, or, or asking for uh, uh, policies that protect farming. There's over 70 farms in the Muskoka area and then in the township of Muskoka Lakes. And they'll be looking for somehow that they are asking to protect these farms uh, for the future. Um, they want to ask that uh, I think we should talk about right now today is that um, 
we, we, we should have an appendix uh, they asked for of all the farms in the township of Muskoka Lakes and exactly where they are. And, uh, and so that's what I would like to propose to um, uh, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond. And um, the, under the, the, under the point um, H213E, agricultural activities shall not be permitted on lands within 150 meters of water body. I think if you, just, if you add or um, new or uh, agricultural, it'll, it'll quiet the historical farmers. Um, all right, so I think it's just new uh, agriculture. Thank you. Okay, are, are we good? I move on to the next person, Mr. McDonald. Um, I, I guess just a very a very brief response. Um, uh, I guess we, we can certainly look to including farms. Uh, I'm not sure um, what the implications of doing that on a map are, um, but in the end, it would only be for information purposes and perhaps that's a good inventory to have uh, at the end of the day. Uh, certainly, if somebody is proposing a severance and a livestock facility is nearby, it's probably good information to have. So, so we'll certainly uh, consider that uh, moving forward. Uh, with the restriction uh, from uh, water bodies, uh, I, I think that language probably should come out. Um, and keeping in mind that agriculture is not permitted within the waterfront designation, I think that was probably the original intent of that particular section. Uh, but both of those uh, we'll, we'll certainly look at. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, David, Mr. Mr. Scalati. Uh, I was gonna speak to what you were asking about earlier in terms of where we're going. And one of my thoughts is that at some point we really should be looking back at what we did learn from the public sessions that were held. Uh, we did hire Lura, I think is the name of the company that put together all the comments and synopsis. And then we did hear from some uh, residents groups as well. And we should be reading those and comparing it to what we've got so far, just to make sure that we are responding to what the public has. And so maybe we can do that in a smaller group other than the, whatever the number is here. But uh, for me, it would be a worthwhile exercise. Well, I think I'm going to ask Mr. Pink to address that or Mr. McDonald, because my understanding is that that input has been considered in these policies. I mean, that's all part of it was that was where the policies started from. But maybe you could be a little more explicit, Mr. McDonald. Uh, yes, I can, uh, Chair Bridgman. Uh, to, to a very large extent, uh, many members of the public who attended the sessions were very concerned about the environment, very concerned about the character of the lakes being eroded over time. Um, and to a very large extent, uh, those are the same directions we received from planning committee as endorsed by council. So I, I think there is a, a, a great consistency between those comments. Of course, there are other comments that uh, were of a different nature, uh, but generally speaking, the, the overwhelming uh, consensus of comments was to be more protective of the environment and the character of the community. And I believe we've done just that through these uh, uh, draft policies. Okay, Councillor Mazan. Thank you, and through you, I, I, I'm going into a completely new direction. So please stop me if this isn't the right time, but given the, the change in, in how we're approaching things, I wanted to mention or discuss the number 26, which is pedestrians and cycling and active transport for a moment. Is that okay? Can we not wait till we get there? Well, I don't know where we are anymore. That's oh. I think that's why I thought, well, I, I felt like the whole conversation was going and I didn't want things to close off before I had a few minutes of an input there. Well, so. we haven't had a great uptake on closing things off. So I think we're continuing okay. the way that we have been and we're on number 10. That's it. We're at number 10 now. We are. That, that's right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Just hold that thought. Mr. Mc... Oh, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you know, the, the old uh, policy that the province had uh, three services per 100 acres, and that uh, I think it was, was a good one. You could get three one acre lots off 100, and that would be more for affordable housing. And that, uh, rather than say a, a two and a half or five acre lot, people, some people just don't want that. They just don't want a nice lot. 
and that. So, you know, I think we should be, be looking at it, but we'll wait till the uh, public will weigh in on it. But uh, I, I think on something like that, it would be uh, uh, really good for affordable housing if we could get one acre lots on that, as long as they're, uh, that they can get a well and septic. Thank you. Okay, I'm just wondering, you. Mr. Diamond, if you wanted to respond to that. Just a couple of reminders to members of uh, both committees in terms of the background information um, that there are, or when we did our background work last year, there were 892 existing vacant lots with frontage on a maintained municipal road in the township. Um, so keep that in mind when you're talking about the ability to create lots and lots being available um, for uh, affordable housing. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention um, uh, was the, the, to, uh, the request for mapping showing existing farms. Uh, we have mapping thanks to the district of all the properties that have the assessment code for farming, which is FRU, um, easy to do, but it's not really what, um, we don't know when the assessment was done and whether or not it's farmed, uh, but we can provide that to you, but it doesn't identify individuals or individual farms. Uh, and the other thing about that was when we identified the agricultural areas, we were looking at um, trying to identify large areas, not individual pockets of agriculture. Um, and so there are agricultural uses that don't show as being agricultural on the draft maps simply because they didn't meet a threshold of being a large enough area to, to warrant that designation. So just a little bit of information when you're reviewing the policies to help you uh, determine um, the applicability. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Edwards, your hand is up. Uh, do you have a supplemental? Yeah, it, uh, and that's of the Metro. Uh, yeah, there, there may be an awful lot of uh, vacant lots around, but if somebody wants to take it off for a family member for uh, their, their uh, property, uh, it, it shouldn't hold them back either. So, uh, and that, uh, just a comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see no other hands, so I think we can move on to attainable housing. Great, uh, Chair Bridgman. So now we're on uh, policy direction number 11. It is about attainable housing. There was already a comment made uh, in the last meeting or the meeting before about how the definition of attainable housing wasn't exactly the same as the districts. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to take a look at that. So that's still on my radar. Um, but what this policy direction uh, did indicate um, is that the official plan should do a number of things. It should establish policies that direct priority and in intensification of infill sites be pre-zoned uh, to permit higher densities, uh, update policies on where secondary dwellings can be permitted in the urban centers, community areas, and the rural areas, um, update current policies to permit where appropriate the establishment of an additional dwelling unit, that means a third, um, on a property in urban centers only, um, direct the creation of attainable housing in urban centers and enable the township to complete a community improvement plan to establish financial incentives for the development of attainable housing. So we did include a uh, section within the official plan dealing specifically uh, with um, attainable housing, that's section L7 in the official plan. Uh, much of the policy in this section uh, comes from the District of Muskoka official plan with that policy coming from the provincial policy statement to some extent. Uh, so we have established that. We've also included policies throughout the plan which permit uh, secondary dwell dwellings, of course, except in the waterfront areas. We've also included a number of new policies uh, in the urban centers uh, section uh, that uh, allows for greater intensification to occur. Um, and the more intensification occurs, the higher the potential for there to be attainable housing uh, as a product of that, uh, particularly when you get different housing types such as townhouses and low rise apartments and secondary suites and so on. Uh, so that's how we've implemented uh, the attainable housing section in the draft official plan. Are there any questions about how we've done that? Uh, Councillor Hayes. Um, 
one of the suggestions that came out of the Heritage and Attainable Housing Group was to remove the restriction of a minimum 750 square foot home. Um, is that reflected in here? I didn't see it. Uh, no, it's not. And I don't recall uh, having uh, that conversation, but I do agree with you on that. And in fact, I think uh, minimum dwelling unit size restrictions were struck down uh, by the courts in some circumstances because it's uh, it's prejudicial uh, in one way or another. Uh, I'm not sure if that was the right word, um, but uh, so minimum dwelling unit sizes are, are disappearing from zoning bylaws across Ontario. So I think that would happen in the normal course. Um, certainly including that within the plan to make that clear would would be a good idea and we'd be happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you, um, I, I, although I just put my hand down, sorry, um, because Donelda actually uh, spoke uh, about what I was going to, and, and in fact, um, other municipalities use the Ontario Building Code to determine the, the size of, of a structure, a livable structure, uh, and um, I think that the way that we've have it laid out, and I again, I, I'll have to uh, have an, a conversation offline with David, that I hope that we can move forward with this very quickly uh, and that we don't have to wait another year or two uh, because some of those changes in our bylaws could be um, quite beneficial for, for many. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Patricia. Sarni. Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I just have a question of clarification. I believe it comes from either a previous OPA or, or the previous OP, but uh, L74 garden suites, what is the rationale between or, or behind the 20 years? Um, just, I've seen it before and I'm one of the securities. Right, the 20 years uh, uh, comes directly from the Planning Act. Uh, the Planning Act used to permit garden suites for up to a 10 year period, uh, but it was recently changed to allow it to occur, allow it to be in place for up to 20 years. The main difference between garden suites and secondary dwellings or basement apartments is that garden suites are intended to be temporary. Uh, so that's why there is a, a cap on the amount of time they can be there through a temporary use bylaw. So that number comes directly from the Planning Act. Okay, Councillor Hayes. Um, provincial policy says that we should develop any all of our uh, multi-residential units on services. Uh, in areas that don't have services, such as Humphrey, that built their retirement home on a shared services plan, they were able to go ahead and do that development. That would be great for attainable housing to be able to build outside the two urban areas with housing. Um, their official plan allows that. Uh, even though it's contrary to provincial policy and it would be contrary to district policy, but we should, this is something that we should be considering um, if the services can support it, if there's someone that's willing to develop it in the rural area rather than in the um, urban areas where land is at a premium, um, we should be looking at considering this in our official plan. Uh, for this one, I'm gonna to turn to Mr. Diamond for a response. If I can, um, the Humphrey example is actually in the community of Humphrey. And that's the example where they did um, five units on one septic system. And they did a couple of clusters of units and a couple of septic systems on different lots. Um, and the municipality was a partner in that project. Um, and it, as I said, it worked well. Um, so one consideration for us at this stage could be to provide policies in the unserviced um, communities that would en enable that type of development to occur. At least in the communities, we have a level of community support services in terms of retail employment, institutional uses. Um, and I could see that happening. Um, so certainly we'll undertake to do that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention and just 
to throw out as an idea. I'm sorry to be bringing up new ideas at this stage in the game, but I will say that yesterday I spent a whole morning in Port Carling and the whole afternoon in Bala, looking at every nook and cranny of those communities. And one of the considerations that maybe we should be considering at this stage is pre-designating or designating certain sites within those communities as priority intensification sites to say that if intensification is going to occur, these sites have priority. It would take a little bit more work, but after what I've done yesterday and previously, I don't think it would be a whole step. And the idea with that would be if council predetermines that this, these areas have a priority for intensification, um, then it should be easier for the people that, to acquire or who already own those properties to develop uh, more intense, higher density development in those spots because they'll have official plan support. Just a thought. Okay, so do we want to add that onto our list for afterwards and then we'll see if there's any appetite to discuss it then. I think maybe that's how I'll deal with that, but thank you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just on the uh, Humphrey thing, where they, they put five units on a septic, uh, I see Summer Valentine is uh, is uh, in the meeting. I don't know if she'd like to to uh, comment on what the uh, district would be thinking about that. I, I know when we were asking for private service up in uh, Manette, it was turned down. But I I don't know if something on a smaller scale would uh, be uh, able to to uh, go forward. Thank you. So welcome, Summer. Do you think you might be able to give us some insight on that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Councillor is quite right. We did recently review private communal services in quite a bit of detail from a legislative and risk perspective, including environmental and human health risks through a uh, process related to Minette. Um, in that case, Muskoka District Council stood behind its long-standing approach to private communal services. Um, which is that they're not permitted for residential uses. Whether there'd be some flexibility for attainable housing or um, long-term care facilities that are at a smaller scale, that really wasn't the question before council at the time. Um, so I would imagine that if that's what the township is looking to propose, we can certainly go back with um, any ideas that you have and see what type of response that we can, uh, can generate from from the council, um, but as I said, it's been a long-standing position of the council um, that private communal services are not necessarily um, supportable. So I'm just in terms of um, process here, would we want to see if Summer could do that for us? And Mr. McDonald, maybe you'd like to, you look like you, you would like to say something. Yeah, I guess just just in addition to all of that, I guess there there are two different concepts. One is private communal services that is that is in one ownership um, and is, for example, servicing four rental units within one building. That's basically one septic system. It's owned by the owner of that building and he rents out units. So that's one kind of communal services. The other type is where units are divided into separate holdings, where which you can give it, convey separately. And then you need another organization to actually own the services. And that's what typically happens in a condominium. So I can see there being some flexibility with respect to uh, you know, multiple units within a building or on a property that is under one ownership. And that perhaps is what Councillor Edwards is sort of heading towards. And I think that's something we, we can accommodate. But going beyond that to permit uh, uh, the division of property or the creation of units that can be conveyed separately on private communal services, that's a whole other conversation. Um, so something to keep in mind, but we can certainly look at the, 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 pre, the former example and come up with some ideas on that. Well, I think that would be very helpful. So you good, Councillor Edwards? All right. Uh, I don't see anything else on this then, Mr. McDonald, so maybe we can move on. Great. I think we'll be able to go a little bit more quickly uh, through some of the ones that are coming up, um, keeping my eye on about 10 to 4. So rural contractors, yards, 
Um, basically, policy direction uh, requires that the official plan recognize that they're important uh, for the economy, which, which we do. Um, and in order to do that, we've included, uh, we've carried forward actually the waterfront count contractors yard policy framework in the waterfront area into the new official plan, basically as is in section E10. E uh, we've also created a rural industrial commercial area designation that applies to two areas in the township uh, where we permit rural contractors yards and a wide range of uses. And then we also recognize the concerns about rural contractors yards and their impacts on, on others. Um, so we've included a restriction on rural contractors yards and the rural waterfront area interface. Uh, and we've also included policies within uh, the rural uh, contractor yards section that requires uh, consideration for impacts when new contractors yards are proposed, such as noise, um, uh, dust, and so on. So I believe we've implemented that direction um, as uh, set out by uh, council. Is there any questions on that section? I'm seeing none, so um, let's move on. Great. Next one is agricultural uses, policy direction 13. Uh, so there was a direction to establish a new designation uh, within your rural area, and we've called it local agricultural area. The reason we use local is because we wanted to avoid calling it a prime agriculture area, which it's not. And prime agriculture area has a whole host of policies embedded in the provincial policy statement that are quite restrictive, quite frankly, to, to perhaps what uh, the township is looking for. For example, if we call it prime agriculture area, there is no lot creation permitted according to provincial policy in prime agriculture area. So that's why we didn't do that. Uh, so Mr. Diamond looked at the mapping uh, very carefully and it was uh, from him in conjunction with Mr. Pink uh, that the mapping for this local agriculture area was developed. And in addition, and in order to protect the main function of agriculture areas, a restrictive lock creation policy was also established in this area, if only to, uh, I guess, protect these areas from further fragmentation. The larger these areas are, the better they function. The more they are fragmented, the less better they function is quite simply uh, the, the philosophy behind that. Um, if there are any questions about that, uh, Mr. Diamond or myself can answer them. Any questions, Council or committee? Okay, I think we're good. Great. Uh, number 14, uh, permitted uses in, in uh, rural and agricultural areas. I think Mr. Diamond already went through this to some extent. So what we did is we, we tried to make sure that we established an extensive list of permitted uses in both of those designations um, with an increased focus on home businesses and home occupations. They were already permitted certainly, uh, but there are enhanced permissions uh, for these types of uses uh, in that area. Uh, so I believe we have implemented it. So the, the, uh, the sections in the official plan that deal specifically with permitted uses are H211 and H222. And we'd be happy to take any questions on that. Can I, can I just... If sure. I, oh, sorry, Mr. Please. Diamond. That, one of the things I wanted to mention was when we were looking at the permitted uses, we've expanded the permitted uses to recognize the growing artistic and cultural community in the rural and agricultural areas. Um, and the impact that that has on uh, improving tourism opportunities away from the waterfront. And so we've broadened those uses to uh, allow agritourism uses, um, small scale art galleries and exhibition spaces and uh, commercial industrial uses serving the agricultural community to kind of encourage rural economic development in the township. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. I should have mentioned those examples because uh, uh, those are great ideas and we're certainly seeing that across Ontario. There's a renewed interest in developing these uses uh, uh, for those experiences that these areas provide. Okay, Councillor Hayes. Um, thank you. Um, under the permitted uses, could we include uh, greenhouses in there? to extend our season and... Um... That would certainly be an easy addition uh, to both of those lists. So we're happy to do that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an agricultural use, it's permitted. Yeah. 
Okay, so maybe I could ask a question here. Would something like a mini brewery be allowed in that area or a winery? I'm thinking of Prince Edward County. You know, that that's where that's where I'm getting that from. Yeah, absolutely. If it's agriculturally related. So certainly um, um, if I don't know if you can grow grapes in uh, in Muskoka or not, um, but I, people are growing blueberries and taking cranberries and making wine out of that. Um, Maybe I wouldn't drink it, but uh, they're doing it. So certainly that would be fine. Um, I, I I bet you can grow hops in uh, in Muskoka, having been involved in that industry a little bit. Um, so it would it needs to be agriculturally related. It's not just an excuse to set up a brewery um, somewhere. But if it's if it is agriculturally related, Prince Edward County is the greatest example I know of uh, that has in the last 20 years just exploded with agritourism because of the, the wineries there. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hayes, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't let you do your follow-up there. No, it was a new one, but I would like to have uh, aquaculture added to the list of uses as well, since we have the Milford Bay Trout Farm and a private uh, trout pond on Walker's Point. Okay, that looks like notes are being taken. So great. Um, Ms. Lindell, Liz? Oh, thank you. I was just going to add that um, apples, we grow apples quite well. And cideries are all the rage in Prince Edward County as well. And I think that could be a very viable agricultural um, use of rural area. Noted, I believe. So, okay. Uh, I don't see any more hands. So perhaps we could move on then. Great, and, and just in response to those suggestions, I, I think most, if not all of those uses probably would have fit under the agricultural sort of permission that we had established, but uh, adding that additional clarity makes it clear that uh, everyone knew what that meant uh, when that was discussed. So I, we certainly support that. Um, next one is uh, policy direction 15, short-term rentals. There was a lot of discussion on this particular point. Um, and in the end, uh, it was acknowledged, I think, that there wasn't uh, a need for anything in the official plan on short-term rentals, uh, because the most effective way of doing that is through a licensing system. However, there was a policy direction um, to include policies that basically said the township would explore that um, as appropriate moving forward. So that's exactly what we did. It doesn't mean you, you have to, it doesn't mean you don't uh, have to. Um, it really just says you'll explore it. So it's a very simple policy in section L9 and we've done just that. Um, if I can suggest, I don't think we need to debate the issue here because it's not an official plan issue. Yeah, please carry on. All right, next one is uh, shared workspaces. Um, so this one uh, basically said uh, that we should be anticipating in the official plan future changes to zoning regulations uh, and uh, to, to reflect and permit shared working spaces and short-term events in designated commercial areas. And we've done that in section L10D. Uh, um, I think this would have been inevitable anyways. And certainly as you update your zoning bylaw, uh, it would certainly be something we recommend the township consider uh, more fully through that process. Great. Any questions on that? Great. We're flying now. <laughs> not, I, 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 don't fix this. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So please carry on. Right. So policy direction number 17, I believe uh, we've covered off most of this. It deals specifically uh, with uh, site alteration, uh, but there's a, a, a little bit of a different focus here. Um, so in this particular policy direction, it talked about uh, making sure the official plan contained, contained um, a, uh, a site alteration target, which we talked about a couple of meetings ago, so we don't need to go back there. Uh, it also talked about um, including detailed policies that establish a series of objectives and criteria that would need to be considered when minor variance applications are submitted in the future. I actually enjoyed writing this section because determining what is minor and what criteria should be applied is always a challenge, uh, certainly when looking at minor variance applications. So we took a stab at that in section E4.8. Uh, uh, there already was a section in your official plan that basically said, here are the things to consider 
but it didn't apply any measurement of that. So what we did is we established actual criteria that said the committee should be satisfied that certain things uh, are happening or, or will happen as a consequence of approving a minor variance. So we've done that in section E4.8. Uh, and then lastly, there was direction that we include policies that discourage major site alterations through blasting when considering Planning Act applications. And we've done that in section E47B um, sub five and D. So I believe we've talked about most of these already, but if there are any additional questions, we'd be happy to take them. Okay, committee. Uh, uh, Patricia, are you? Thank you, Chair Richman. I apologize. I'd like to go back to l 10 one d and the policy direction that the l 10 one d clearly um, indicates flexibility, but I don't see short-term events spelled out. And okay, that, that, is, that is something I believe we really need in Muskoka. Okay, that's probably an oversight on our part, so we will make sure it um, it comes in there. And you know, short-term events they 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 can be sometimes challenging. And I should point out that uh, the Municipal Act has a specific uh, section dealing with special events and special event permits, and there's a whole permitting process associated with that if the township was ever interested. Um, but uh, certainly, we'll add that in. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to go to uh, E4 7D, and it reads Major site alteration through blasting will be discouraged when considering all applications under the Planning Act. Could you just explain what that means and, and how that would be implemented? Uh, you're on yeah, mute. Sorry, sorry <laughs> okay. about that. I try to mute when I'm not talking so I don't create any background noises. So the reason why we wrote that is because there are two different processes that one follows. There's a blasting bylaw that applies. And I understand there's been some discussion about, about that bylaw and whether it needs to be beefed up or not. So that's certainly outside of the official plan process and that's a separate discussion. And then there's the planning act process. So when someone requires a minor variance or site plan approval, that's when this policy would come into effect. And basically it's discouraging uh, major blasting uh, through those processes. It's not prohibiting because I don't think we can prohibit globally because there are circumstances where it does make sense to do some blasting to get a better product. Um, so this was the language we came up with. We're certainly open to suggestions on that, um, but there are two ways to get at this issue and one is outside the uh, official plan and one is in. Supplementary? Supplementary? Yep, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I just... Um... It seems pretty weak to me. So what, what I guess what I hear you're saying is this would be covered by the by the site plan or the or the uh, minor variance or whatever. But um, uh, sh shouldn't it, shouldn't it be stronger? Does anyone else feel that way? In other words, um, uh, maybe I'm just. Uh, <laughs> It just seems very, very, very weak to me. So uh, was that intentional? Um, Certainly in response. I mean, I, 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 know, I know it's a tough issue, and, and uh, but uh, it's going to continue, I guess. Is, that's what I... So I guess in response and very quickly, uh, we took the policy direction exactly as it was worded, and we turned it into a policy in this case. So the policy direction said discourage major site alterations through blasting. And that's exactly what we did in the policy framework. I certainly do recall there being quite a bit of discussion on this issue during the policy directions discussion. And this is where we ended up um, because there was, I don't think absolute consensus on an approach, but there was agreement that it should be discouraged for sure. Uh, so that's what we've done. Okay, Mr. Clark. 
Um, just a quick comment. I mean, generally, I just don't agree with having to go to site plan on existing sites anyway, although I do agree if it's a major change, et cetera, we should. And in fact, generally, we do through the current grandfathering process, which is about to come up. I think to Councillor Jaglowitz's uh, comments, um, we've gone from not requiring site plan at all to requiring site plan here. And I would suggest that there'll be all kinds of trades and balances that go off if we go through this process, hopefully including things like if you've got a cottage that's going to be 66 feet back and you have to blast a pile of rock that it might be considered that the cottage would be allowed to be slightly closer to the water to avoid that. Right now we actually make people stick to the 66 feet and then they blast. And option two is you go to 100 or 150 feet and people cut their trees down. So those are all of the things that were, you know, that I think if you go down this path, um, again, if you take the most extreme examples of everything suggested, um, it's going to be very difficult to uh, get people to where they want to go with, uh, um, you know, a renovation, et cetera. Um, you know, but the other side, I think, is it's opening the door to all kinds of negotiation as to what's right for that specific lot. So it's going to take a lot more time to get there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laurie, Ms. Thompson. Uh, yes, was there going to be any consideration as to how major is defined in terms of major blasting? Does that happen in the, the zoning bylaw? Does that happen in the blasting bylaw? Uh, I think in response, it's very difficult to determine that, uh, primarily because rock is everywhere. Um, and in some cases, it's necessary to blast to achieve a better outcome. So trying to do that in advance is very difficult. And I think that's probably why we ended up with discourage because that's probably as far as we can go uh, through that process. And as, um, as Mr. Clark indicated, because we're setting up a system where a lots of negotiation occurs, that ends up being one of the negotiated items through such a, a negotiation process. Okay, uh, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you. Um, and through you, I think Councillor Jaglos brought it up. Is anyone interested in being sort of more restrictive in this particular policy? Um, it's a tough discussion. I've had uh, numerous discussions over the uh, past couple of terms of council with our former CVO um, about putting metrics in place about what is major to uh, Lori's perspective, uh, what constitutes uh, too much blasting, too little blasting. I, I think the reality is uh, even if you're redeveloping a lot today, when you've got to move to 66 feet back, out of let's say 20,000 lots, there might be a hundred of them that you could build without blasting. Um, there's so much rock and uh, angle that somewhere, somehow, a corner of the cottage is gonna have to be blasted some portion of it. So I think then it gets to what is major or significant. And I'm happy to kind of continue having that discussion going forward. Um, but I think when it comes to blasting that there is negotiation that do you need to move it five feet forward so you're not blasting a bunch of rock? But would you rather blast five feet of rock away that is truly a rock shelf or would you rather take down 10 trees? I don't know which is better. That's There's a whole bunch of questions about that. I don't have the answer, but uh, I'm certainly not in an official plan wanting to be more, more, more restrictive in this particular case. I think we just open ourselves up to problems. Okay, uh, Councillor Jagler, let's follow up. Yeah, yes, thank you. I, I guess uh, I have maybe found my words now. 30 years ago, when people went to build on a lot, uh, they were respectful of the, of the terrain, and they built in a place that they, they could accommodate it within the rock. Uh, today, and, and Riverdale Road is a good example of it, they tear down that cottage that was built uh, uh, around the rock, and they try to blast it and create a flat lot. And um, these are big lots. There's lots of places to build. Um, and, and then maybe there's lots that are unbuildable because of the rock. So it just seems to me that uh, we're not doing anything here. You know, did it ever cross anybody's mind that maybe there are some lots that we shouldn't be building on? 
So I just give it some thought. Uh, the way I see this, it's, it's, it's a nothing. And uh, uh, I guess that's uh, one for uh, Mr. Clark. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's, maybe, maybe let, 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 yeah, let's not get into much of a debate here, guys. So, so go yeah. ahead, Bob. But. Anyway, I think this goes right back to cumulative effects. And I think talk and, and just simply talking about 30 and 40 years ago, I'm respectful of what people did. The fact of the matter is we didn't have the technology or the capability to do a lot of things and especially not safely or precisely. We do now. All right. Okay. Um, I believe um, Bob, your hand is still up. If you want to just take it down, please. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but um, okay, so Mr. McDonald, you yes. carry on here. So I'm going to turn next to water accesses and, and mainland docking and parking. That's policy direction number 18. And I tasked uh, Mr. Diamond uh, with uh, looking at this particular section and coming up with some recommendations. Recommendation. So I'm going to pass it off to him. Thanks. The planning direction uh, was was pretty clear. Um, that the municipality wanted to move to a system where, uh, where new lots were created, um, that it would be necessary to ensure that there was title, to uh, ensure that there was perpetual access uh, to new lots that were created. Uh, and, uh, and so we've done that. I've seen comments on it already that people are concerned about it. Um, I will uh, remind members of the committee that we discussed it quite thoroughly and um, gave examples of other municipalities uh, within the district and uh, in Humphrey Township where this is an absolute requirement. Huntsville and Humphrey are examples where, uh, where you have to do it. And so um, we built the policies into your plan to do it for the first time um, rather, rather than um, simply accept a letter from the marina saying they've got a spot for you when you need it. Okay, any comments from anyone? Mark. Just, uh, you know, again, a quick note, 140 foot lot today or sub 140 foot lot on Lake Muskoka with a complete teardown on it probably just sold for $700,000 over ask at 950 or 968,000, um, had 14 bids on it. And again, I just wanna make people understand you could have a 350 or $400,000 island lot that you're saying somebody can't do anything with unless they have, unless they go buy a one point something million dollar piece of land to launch from. I may have that wrong, Jim, but if you have a better summation of that, I'm desperate to hear it because I think you're going to have a lot of upset people um, that own islands. Jim? Well, I, I will say this is probably this policy is going to encourage the establishment of more waterfront landings. And, um, and you know, that may or may not be what the intention is, but I think it's a better solution than uh, telling, uh, saying that it's okay to get a letter from a, an already overcrowded marina. Oh, Mr. Pink would like to say something. Sorry to jump in, thank you, Chair. I think just to clarify uh, Member Clerk's uh, comments, uh, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but these policies would only apply to new lot creation. And I think your concerns, Mr. Clark, were, were stemming that uh, existing lots would be subject to this requirement. Uh, as the policy certainly would encourage uh, retaining or uh, acquiring mainland access of some form, but uh, these policies would only apply to new lot creation, just so that everyone is clear. Thank you, that, that was very helpful. Um, Mr. Scaletti, David? And my only comment was on Wilford, which is water access lots. And I guess the way I'm reading that, I could own a property in Gravenhurst, which would give me the mainland property and an island and Lake Joe. So there's no requirement for the water access to be close or across the way. So I, I don't have any answer on how to correct it, but it is, uh, it could be an issue. Talk about creative thinking. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Hayes. Thank you. I think the issue with 
island property is not that they get a letter from the marina, but they get a letter from the marina and then they don't use it. They go to a public docking place and stay overnight. Well, the solution isn't to prohibit people from developing a lot and not having a letter from the marina. It's to go to the public waterfront access and say over no, no overnight parking. Um, it's as simple as that. And then that way, people that do have waterfront access will have to find alternate ways to access their property. And that will, whether it be through friends, whether it be through the marinas, um, as long as they have the letters saying that it's it's ongoing and they're available, they should be able to do that. And I, marinas make a lot of their money by having slips for these places that have uh, water access only. And I don't think that we should be interfering with their business. So go after the no parking in the uh, public access points, no overnight parking. And I think you'd solve your problem. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lindell, Liz? Um, I'm just wondering if uh, we had considered, what if someone has a waterfront landing and they provided a deeded right of way onto that waterfront landing. Would that satisfy the condition we're talking about? Yes, it's deeded. Okay, thank you, Mayor Harding. Um, thank you, I guess it's interesting. I mean, what is the problem we're really trying to solve? Real new waterfront lots that are really being created are on Lake Joe, the larger islands. Um, to um, Donalda's comment about uh, overnight parking, really the only public place we have is Foots Bay Marina. They control it. There's no over Foots Bay uh, parking there. There might be issues down on Lake Muskoka. I'm not disagreeing. There are some public places, but let's fix that problem, as she says, versus Another creative problem, you know, we, we have this council has turned down the creation of waterfront landings. We don't want to see more landings and it's going to turn into a landing and people coming in and out. Uh, I've watched it every term of council for the last three terms of us controlling and saying we don't want more boats in this particular area. And I agree, we're taking away from the businesses of marinas that can offer slips. And at the end of the day, if I'm going to buy an island property, it's probably because I want a cheaper option to get on the lake necessarily than I want to get on from a mainland. And if I'm buying, you know, struggling to spend a million dollars on uh, a waterfront island property, I probably don't have another $500,000 to put into a mainland because now I'm in a 1.5, 1.7 plus taxes, da, 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 to buy a mainland property. So um, I, I think we will effectively shut down any new lot creation uh, on Lake Joseph with this policy. Mr. Diamond, you look like you want to say something. No, I'm just listening intensely. Um, Patricia? Thank you, Chair. I, I would just like to follow up on the E444 and make sure that it's clear and the language should go in there that the creation of new waterfront uh, access lots, because I'm also concerned about development of lots that are vacant, that are owned. And where do those people fit in? Because they are now going to need more access to their properties. I guess I'd like protection that the, the rules that are as they are now apply to them and it's only for newly created not including newly developed i guess quick response is the the policy was written to deal only with lot creation and we will make that very clear it was not written to somehow penalize uh, someone who has a vacant lot uh, and who is at the same time eligible for a building permit today. So that was not the intent. Mr. Diamond? There's just one more thing I wanted to add, and it's kind of in conjunction with this, is the revised policies on marinas um, also encourage uh, valet service um, and also encourage 
parking and boat storage facilities off site. Um, so that provides policies for some of the existing marinas to expand, but not directly in the waterfront area. Um, I know having worked a lot in Georgian Bay, that there's uh, a number of marinas in Georgian Bay that actually keep most of the people's boats well off site. And you call them when you hit Barry and say, have my boat in the water in an hour and a half and it's there, um, which is a much better solution. But I think we need to consider this in, in light of the marina policies too. Okay. Um, I don't see any further discussion. We're at 356. So I think you probably want to do your wrap up, Mr. McDonald. Yes, uh, you, you read my mind. Uh, I believe in hard meeting endings if possible. Um, so I think we've made some really good progress um, in looking at the remaining policy directions. Uh, there, there uh, is at least two that we've already talked about that I don't think we need to come back to. One, it deals with grandfathering um, and, 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 what, and what you can do within 20 meters um, and so on. So I don't think we need to go back there. There was also some direction provided on mineral resource uses, two changes that were voted upon and those will be made. The rest of them are fairly um, minor in my view and I'm hoping we're able to go through them very quickly uh, at the beginning of the next meeting on the 16th. I do note, of course, that the, uh, the, the last policy direction dealing with resorts obviously is a discussion item. Um, and what I'd like to do when it comes to that is provide a little bit of background on where the actual policies came from and the rationale for them because they are quite new and they are somewhat different than what you already have in your official plan today. So that's where we are. and. I'm really hopeful we can finish the remaining ones probably in no more than a half hour at the next meeting, other than the resort piece. Um, I will also undertake along with uh, Mr. Diamond and Mr. Pink to prepare a fairly brief overview of the more restrictive provisions in the official plan uh, that will be circulated to this group um, prior to the next meeting. I'm not gonna promise a date, but it'll definitely be a couple of days before the 16th, so you have them. It will take us some time to make sure we got that all right. Um, and that's where we are. And again, as I indicated at the beginning, we are at your beck and call in terms of what the next steps are. I'd see certainly a next meeting. What happens after that? is a discussion item. I have some ideas, uh, but we should uh, certainly leave some time at the next meeting to discuss what those next steps may be. Agreed, agreed. So I know Councillor Roberts wants to, to uh, uh, make a comment here. So Councillor Roberts, and then I have Mayor Harding. Yes, Madam Chair. I would request that we leave mineral number 22 um, on for discussion. I have a few points to raise with that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you, uh, and I appreciate quickly the conversation okay. on water access lots. I guess if that's gonna stay, in my opinion, we should be writing another policy that encourages the development of waterfront landings to balance it out. I think we have one of those coming up at the next planning committee meeting. So there you go, the intro. Um, all right, so that's it, Mr. McDonald, you're, you're good. Okay, Mr. Pink, any comments? No, you're good? All right, well, th thank you everyone very, very much for today. And I look forward to us getting back together. And yes, I will read this last motion, Mr. Clerk, if that's why you just popped on the screen. Um, uh, we get back together on the 16th and hopefully we can wrap this all up on the 16th. So I'm going to uh, move by a motion, move by, um, Member Edwards, seconded by Member Zavitz, be it resolved that the special planning committee meeting adjourn at 4.01. Oh, all in favor? Good, uh, you're good. Madam Chair, that's carried. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone and uh, enjoy the next week and a half and we'll see you all back here on the morning of the 16th.